We're not a yes. <laughs> we don't yeah. do introductions and stuff. We just well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Normally, I think it might, we don't do introductions. We usually on the on the on the group chats we tend to. Yeah. You know. We yeah, we're kind of a bit more formal on things like that. But we're we're not quite the traditional podcast that kind of yeah, starts with Hello everybody, this is script. And then yeah. ends with and then yeah, yeah we don't do the script stuff. And normally we're halfway through a sentence when I hit go. And that just kind of yeah, then everyone's kind of in the ch- in the listening going again, what are they talking about? <laughs> so Andy, I, what I, I are we, we talking totally, about? We can we can do introductions this week. We can totally we can. Do that. we could do introductions. Well, I'll I'll, I'll just kind of do yeah, I'm not sure actually how to do an introduction. <gasps> yeah, we're, we're, we're 69, it's a 16 episode 69. Should have been 70, oh, yeah. but we missed a week. Because um, mm-hmm. normally our group chats are on the kind of 10th. We've pressed that up at least twice. Um, yeah, so today's topic is neurodiversity because I think it's an important topic uh, for many reasons. Uh, educationally, personally. Reasons we shall discuss. Socially, and for reasons that we shall discuss. Uh, I think it's probably worth stating at this point that as far as I know, none of us are qualified psychologists or psychotherapists or john are you i'm i'm a i'm a trained um like dyslexia and neurodiversity advisor ah that's, um, that's so you're right. that's, you're are you're absolutely you're our trained expert then um but i don't um, have any like any like bits of PhD. paper like university bits of paper for that so i've got bits of paper mm. but they're not that <laughs> <laughs> as a dyslexic person I, I like to avoid pieces of paper <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's pictures on other pictures, which is a good. Entirely <laughs> better. Yeah, so I think I think it's worth stating at this point we are. Uh, Sean is our our most expert person in terms of training. Mm. Um, I'm probably close second because of training I've had as a teacher. Um, I'm I'm, I'm happy uh, to many I'm years happy to go with that. Yeah. Uh, but that, uh, yeah, I, I, I never, I worked in a school that did specialise in, uh, particularly Asperger's, as it was known then. It used but to be. A known lot of people as, don't yeah. like it being yes. called that. But go and listen For to several reasons. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember which is the best. There's Ologies uh, is a good podcast to listen to to find out why we don't use that phrase anymore, uh, even though it's still widely known. And some people still identify with it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's yeah. not the best. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, I think basically what I'm trying to say is, yeah, we, we are may not say stuff that, yeah, there may be things, things that people wrong. disagree with. We may get things wrong, um, but we're trying and we want to kind of sort of share our thoughts and some of our knowledge and experience uh, in maybe more visibility to it. Yes. yes. Yeah, I definitely think we're, we're all bringing some sort of lived experience. Here starting today, the com- starting the conversation yes yeah so i think that's 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 probably the best way about it we're gonna have a waffle about neurodiversity well um, shall we get uh, shall we ask sean to explain yeah. neurodiversity for us then? cool yeah <laughs> um so there's a couple of a couple of ways i guess of defining it and i think there are various different things that people use depending on where they're coming at it from um I guess one of my favorite, which is slightly more scientific, is that if we were to take, um, if we would take everyone who's watching or listening to this, and we were to take them somewhere where there was a, an fMRI machine, a functional MRI machine, where we could scan their brains, we would find that we all have what are called functional and structural differences in our brains. So we have differences in the way that our brains, like, are physically structured, and then differences in the way that our brains process electrical signals, and there are like huge huge variations between all the, everyone's brains and um neurodiversity is a way of referring to um is referring to like some of those specific sets of differences that we have names for um so that's one like really scientific way of, of thinking about it the fact that all of our brains are different and neurodiversity is a is a way to celebrate the fact that all our brains are different which i, um, I like i like that a bit hmm. yeah and, and you know, and then there's the being being kind of engineering you sciencey people as well. We like things for, when they have when they have a grounding in a grounding in like bits of machinery that were and buzz. Um, but then, but the actual term neurodiversity came from a lady called Judy Singer, who was a she was an Australian um, sociologist, and um, she she was uh, she was autistic herself, and she first used the term um, during her work in the sort of early nineties. 
and um, and she sort of kind of came up with it in the context of a, a kind of social construct. So um, she's sort of two famous quotes that she said. So she, she said that um, neurodiversity may be every bit as crucial for the human race as biodiversity is for life in general. Um, and she's she like famously, famously said, um, who can say what form of wiring will prove best at any given moment? Um, so she was framing neurodiversity as um, so we have a society that is increasingly um, and in the 90s less so, but still increasingly um, being um, trying to champion um, equality um, in the context of gender, race, religion, sexuality and age. And Judy Singer was one of the first people to kind of give a name to the idea that we should also be doing that in the context of these natural variations in our brains, um, particularly as we have a society who that um, tends to prioritize or um, focus on particular ways of thinking and learning. Um, so when we're using neurodiversity in, a, in an educational sense, which is guess where your background comes in, Andy, um, typically we're referring to people who have, um, who have specific learning differences. So this could be things like dyslexia, autism, yep. ADHD, dyspraxia. Um, mm. So there's kind of two ways, two things really. There's, there's neurodiversity in a kind of everyone's brains a different sense and we should celebrate that and recognize that. And then there's um, individual people who might refer to themselves um, or indeed be diagnosed as neurodivergent um, rather than neurotypical. Neurotypical would be saying people who, um, who perhaps think and learn in a, in a way we would consider traditional. Um, and then people who might identify as neurodivergent in the sense that they feel like they're, they think and learn in, um, in ways that could be diagnosed as dyslexia or autism or ADHD. Um, and um and yeah so there's sort of a there's two kind of ways of looking at it um both which is kind of neuro atypical is another is another ter common mm. term that's yeah. used kind of interchangeably with neurodivergent yeah and there's and yeah and it's and it's like it's, it's the nice thing about um about neurodiversity is it's not um it's not singling people out unless mm. they there's there's room there to celebrate that all of our the fact that all of our brains are different um yeah. and it's completely mad when there's like there's you know we yeah the fact that there's 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 almost more diversity in our brains than there is in any other aspect of like what it means to be human um, and the fact that we don't we don't acknowledge that is just mental yeah mm. absolutely that's awesome that was that was like the most like in-depth like descriptive descriptor of it i've ever heard that was great <laughs> I think maybe for the benefit of people who perhaps aren't so au fait with perhaps some of the terms, well, obviously we, we've just defined neurodiversity, uh, but you specifically mentioned uh, four particular types of neurodiversity. So we've got mm -hmm. dyslexia. So dyslexia would be, I mean, Sean, your, your dyslexia is one of your um, yeah. interests. Um, so I, so I'm, I'm dyslexic. I'm diagnosed as dyslexic. Um, dyslexia is a genetically inherited neurological difference. So it tends to get passed down family lines. So my dad's dyslexic, my brother's dyslexic. Um, in general, it affects people. Um, the classic thing, if you ask the average person on the street, when you say about dyslexia, is they think of people having difficulty reading and writing or difficulty with spelling or um, the orders of letters. But actually, it's, it's more wide ranging than that. It can affect things like um, sort of wider processing ability is the general term and that process the sort of speed of processing information is something that is um kind of extends to lots of forms of learning differences um but in the case of dyslexia um it can it can impact your um your working memory so for me my dyslexia predominantly affects my my memory rather than my reading and writing ability um uh it can affect things like um numerical information processing um, it can affect things like sequencing, so days of the week, months of the year. Um, so it's anything really that can do that's sort of to do with kind of processing information. But it's confusing because the word dyslexia basically means difficulty with language, but it's language in a in a much wider sense than just the word. Out of word. Mm -hmm. curiosity. Some... Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say there's, there's some significant sort of crossover there with this calculator, which you haven't specifically mentioned, but yeah is is not dissimilar so dyscalculia is actually quite rare so um so there's lots of dyscalculia one of the best ways i've heard it described as um uh is um so someone with dyscalculia might not recognize so if i was to hold my fingers up you might automatically look at that and go there's four fingers there yeah. someone with dyscalculia might not might, might not recognize the fourness of four they might actually have to count those fingers to go oh there's four there 
So oh. an, an actual actual dyscalculia is quite rare. Often when people are struggling with numbers, it can be it can be because of dyslexia, it can be because of other other learning challenges. Um so um but but yeah, that's, um, that's the, the, like the, the sort of thing that would come more for, perhaps from an injury um, than perhaps something like you're reminding me of propagnosia, which is the inability to recognize faces. And like the way you described it, it sounds it sounded kind of similar, which I know is, is often a thing that is brought on from from like an, an injury, a brain injury. Yeah, I'd like like never heard of it before. In, it's an interesting one. So it's something. Um, so it is with with kind of learning differences there is totally scenarios where people can it can experience like head injuries and things and then it, and then experience learning challenges as a result of that mm. but it's Brains it's, impo it's important to make a d clear distinction that um if you have adhd or add or you have dyslexia <laughs> those things aren't the product of of a, a breakage or an accident those are things basically that you know they those are things that you you know you have in you and from from when you were born they're not they're not are. errors or things yeah. that need to be corrected um and 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 it's it's it gets quite murky when you start going down the territory of, and it's important yeah to yeah yeah, and, yeah absolutely absolutely um, you just made me think yeah. of it specifically with the this this god i can't even say it um the, <laughs> cal the, the calculating one Word it's calculia. Yeah. yeah yes this calculia um, I'm going to shut up for a bit because um, I always joke when I'm doing talks about neurodiversity that I'm, I'm the straight white man here talking about diversity, and um, so, I don't, which is, you know, and I'm so I'm um, yeah. Let's um, let's hear from some other people. Well, so, uh, oh, go on, I. What you say? I was just going to say that I wonder if it would be useful if um, so. So so Sean has kind of said a little bit about like what what one of the things he kind of brings to the table in terms of neurodiversity yep. is I don't know if Delani and I want to also kind of introduce our our ourselves and our you know Took particular the words right flavors. out of our mouths. Um, <laughs> sorry? Oh right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I thought that might be um useful. Yeah. Who wants to go first? Delani can go Ali first. suggested <laughs> it. So she could go <laughs> <laughs> I'm I am happy to. I just I'm, I'm I'm also yeah. a big a big talky talky face, um, and I don't want to go on at length for too too long. We can just cut you off if we need to. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, I, obviously, uh, I I have been on the show before, so many of you will will recognize the dulcet tones of my voice if you're listening, and and the shock of red curls if you're watching. Um, but for everyone who doesn't necessarily know me. Hi, I'm Allie Katz, <laughs> um, and I have ADHD, and I am autistic. I will say that I am self-diagnosed autistic because I have not actually found the benefit in pursuing a super formal diagnosis in this country because the process is brutal, and the benefits of an official diagnosis uh, for me would be incredibly negligible because... So there's nothing necessarily to be treated. And I don't stand to benefit from having a school provide me with, you know, um, assistance because I'm not in school and I don't have an employer. So like I have personally decided to not put myself through the um, the process because I know so, many people who've been through it and I, I know how, um, yeah. how, horrible, how horrible it is often, especially if you are um, gender diverse. Which is actually another thing that is worth mentioning is that if you are trans and in in the united kingdom i'll, I'll be specific because i don't know how it is elsewhere if you're trans in the united kingdom and you want to pursue any sort of medical uh transition at any point uh pursuing an autism an, an autism diagnosis can actually hurt that um and can keep you from getting uh gender uh gender affirming treatment which is also another reason why I have not sought out a um, official diagnosis. But I feel very confident um, labeling myself as autistic because I have done a great deal of research, and uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm pretty. Do you want to again? So Sean defined kind of this dyslexia for us. Yeah. Do you want to kind of 
give a bit, a bit of a, <laughs> a definition as 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 best you can to not being a medical professional of ADHD. I mean, maybe all, how it affects you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that might be better. I was gonna say, I don't know. I, well, uh, yeah, break I out the SM five and talk about my personal experiences with these things for sure. I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure how confident I am with uh, <laughs> defining ADHD. Well, I mean, ADHD. First of all, I mean, we're using, we're using letters there. So, um, ADHD, generally... I believe, stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, yeah. which. I don't know if like this is the term that is used now. It used to also be referred to as ADD, which was just attention deficit disorder. Um, these things were initially considered to be two different things and are now considered to be basically one thing that has different variations. Like three presentations, isn't it? Of the same yeah, idea. basically inattentive, uh, hyperactive or both. Guess who's both? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I do have an official diagnosis of mixed um adhd uh i take medication for it i am on a uh i'm on a medication called elvance in this country it's called vivance in north america which is lisdexamphetamine and it is for me uh it was a massive life changer it very much made the difference between me feeling like every day was an intense struggle to function to suddenly feeling like Oh, this is what most people feel like most of the time, isn't it? Just regular things were not such a such a struggle, because um, that really was uh, that was the thing. When things got bad, it got to a point where everything, every little task, every little aspect of my life felt like pushing a boulder up a hill, and that's often how I found myself describing how things felt. Was just like constantly pushing a boulder up the hill, and you're pushing a boulder up the hill when it's sunny and everything's fine and you're pushing a boulder up a hill when it's thunderstorms and mudslides and it just never stopped. You were always pushing a boulder up the hill and you can't stop pushing a boulder up a hill because then it rolls back and it crushes you. Once I started on medication, it felt like the hill got flattened and I could walk away from the boulder, which was kind of amazing. Um, so obviously medication is not for everyone and not everyone finds, you know, finds that medication gives them what they need. It's very valid to have ADHD and not be on medication. Um, but for me, it was great, is great, continues to be great. And is something that I feel very good about just kind of encouraging people to, uh, to do if that feels right for them. For, for me, autism is more, I've realized more kind of around how I perceive the world how I kind of take in information and then also put information back out, if that makes sense. Like it is, it is, I realize it's very much kind of about how the world and I connect and interact. Mm. And it took me a very long time, 35 plus years, to realize that some of my difficulties with interacting with the world were because of this, because I have effectively been speaking a second language very well, <laughs> but it isn't nat it isn't actually what comes to me naturally. And it took actually realizing how many other autistic people I, I feel very close to and comfortable with and how we can interact with each other in a way that feels more natural to me because we kind of speak the same language. Um, to kind of really go like, oh, okay, this all makes a bit more sense. A, a quick question, if I may, is the, the um, you say about the, the way you interact with the world, do you specifically mean people or systems or both? Both, both. Um, systems, definitely, because systems are made by people. Um, hmm. But the systems, largely speaking, are made by people who are neurotypical, for people who are, are neurotypical. neurotypical. Yeah. And I, like many people, and especially many people who are um, assigned female at birth or raised as girls, I w just was taught to not complain. Um, I was taught to internalize the difficulty and simply it's my fault that I'm having a hard time with X. 
Um, and so I would simply teach myself to do better instead mm. of going, oh, wait, this is not made for me. Um, hence, again, part of why it took so many years to realize that this was actually part of what made me different. And I guess that's the thing for me. I always knew it was different. I just mm. just thought it was just different, you know, different with no definition, just different. <laughs> and and it's actually been revolutionary to be able to put those kind of more scientific terms and stuff to things. And to then from there, you know, it's just like, oh, well, now I can, now I've got stuff I can Google, you know, like now I've got stuff I can actually yeah. look up and read about and understand. And so Once that you've got the is, terms, you can find the information. Yeah, that is that sort of defining, which is maybe why I was I was so excited to hear Sean define things the way the way the way he did because it is I find that sort of thing like just so incredibly useful and like opening in a way like this is a thing like things are are being opened in a really good way. Um, mm. So so yeah, so that is I guess kind of. Um, like, I think that that kind of, I feel like those things, those things kind of cover the, 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 the overwhelming majority of the, the things that make me um, neurodivergent. So now, now, now it's still on. <laughs> yeah, oh. It was great to hear uh, what Ali said as well. I was curious to know what dose of Avalanche are you on? Oh, um, I, it's interesting, actually, and this might be useful information to the other people in the audience who have ADHD who menstruate, um, but I am on two doses. I am on, at the moment, I'm on 30 milligrams three weeks of the month and 50 milligrams one week of the month because the hormonal changes actually affect how well you absorb the medication. And so a higher mm -hmm. dose um, for one week of the month is actually been way better for me um and there is there is scientific studies that have looked at this and have shown that like the hormones that are released basically make the the me medication less effective so a higher dose helps because i was definitely feeling out of sorts like one week of the month in a way that was kind of unusual and great the rest of the time so the the higher dose helped so i don't know if anyone else out there listening to this um can benefit from that information but it's very much a thing that like if you are on the medication already you can talk to your doctor about it and say that you would like to try a higher dose one week and uh we'll potentially find it to be like night and day <laughs> like much more useful so yeah so 30 and 50. um i mm -hmm. but i was on actually 50 and 70 and i i went down uh instead of up okay interesting to know i'm on 70. <laughs> oh, okay um, yeah, and yeah, I've taken 70 for two months now, and I'm just like, it's not working. I need a higher dose, but then oh, Edmunds, there's no higher dose. And uh, it's Maybe like it's the last of the, something uh, else. Yeah, those are like the Edmunds is the main thing everyone goes for. And then if you want to take something else, it's like a, I think Edmunds is a steroid based one, and then something else awesome. would be like different. I don't know if it's still steroid, there's a word for it. It has a specific thing in it, whereas everything else doesn't. So, it, yeah. It's certainly one of the newer um, st uh, medical stimulants. Like I know that it's it's definitely like obviously everyone knows about Adderall and Ritalin and like the really mm. old school ones that are like much more harsh. Um, Elvance, yeah. Lizdexamphet Lizdexamphetamine is I think gentler, which is potentially why it's not mm. working. And I know other people actually, you're not alone. I know multiple people who tried mm. it and found it, yeah, at the highest highest dose, it wasn't doing enough. I have, um, mm. I'm quite sensitive to neurologically yeah. based medications. I've, I've learned this through prior experiences with stuff that I, t fortunately, I don't tend to need as much, mm. which means that I get, again, I get a great effect from 30 milligrams, um, but that's not common, I think. I think most people are, yeah, 50 or 70 and yeah some people have definitely found that it's just it's just not enough which means that you might benefit from something like concerta which is going to be i think a little bit stronger a little bit more a little bit more uh oomph. um because yeah if it's not if 70 is not doing it for you yeah you gotta you gotta yeah. get on you gotta you gotta upgrade 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like because my ADHD is quite severe. Yeah, his sound is not doing doing enough. But anyways, I'll I'll give a brief intro intro about uh, me. So hi everyone, my name is Delani. I've got dyslexia and ADHD, so quite severely. But also, like Ali said, I haven't self-diagnosed, but I, th I think I might have autism, but not quite there yet because uh, when I was diagnosed with dyslexia, I was 18. And then um, as I was getting assessed, the assessor was like, you might have ADHD, go check it out. So then I applied through the NHS and I was in the waiting list for ADHD. And four years later, I got a response saying, yep, we're ready to diagnose you. And I saw someone here also said that I'm in the waiting list. Well, uh, also yeah, yeah have fun. Well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah good yeah, luck. Uh, it's very slow, I think, because of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I think it's always been a slow it, one. Though. Yeah, it it pretty much yeah. is. Yes, mm -hmm. here here yeah. in here in the UK, it's it's definitely yeah, it's, a, it's a quicker slow for school age children if they get pushed forward by their school. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but for adults, my understanding is for adults, it's it's always been slow. Slow, and unless you do it privately, but uh, you don't yeah. have. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what I did. Um, that's what oh, i did wow. okay. uh, it was it was very much that sort of like uh i i need to make a choice um of it was that sort of like i have i have the money into my savings to do it and um, i felt very much i had i had an anxiety about it that i was kind of like i could i could spend this money and know right away or i could save it and wait and hope and i was like cost benefit analysis mm. isn't it is sometimes yeah. it's, it's yeah. much it is also worth benefit. mentioning that adhd and autism are extremely comorbid um extremely mm. comorbid like they do exist solo but an overwhelming like a, 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 a not disproportionate number of people who have one have both um as so, also yeah. the case with bipolar disorder bipolar uh, and adhd Ah, wow. Which is why we think mine's probably hidden under the radar. Mm. Oh. Just, I mean, I was just like, so same thing with dyslexia. It's amazing. Having done like dyslexia screenings, um, mm -hmm. it's like really common that people will um, who are dyslexic will also have um, ADD more than um, ADHD, that less, less the hyperactivity component. But um, yeah, so if, this is this crazy thing. This is why it's so that term neurodiversity is so valuable because the reality is that maybe in an ideal world, we wouldn't even have names for these distinct differences. It's the fact that there are, mm. you know, that we have particular ways of doing things in our society that um, that require us to have a specific name for something that has particular areas of, 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 of challenges and strengths. Um, yeah. But yeah, maybe like in a, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a better, <laughs> better world, we wouldn't even have to have names for things. We just accept we all think and learn differently. Well, yeah. this, this is exactly the case, isn't it? If we look, you know, sort of fifty years ago, a hundred years ago, the, the the names for those things weren't there. It was just no, they didn't you, exist you were normal or not, you know. So yeah. it's it's as we get more and more understanding of all of these things, we sort of granularize the nomenclature and and, and figure out better treatments for each of the little nuanced pockets. But Forty or fifty years ago, there were some there were names given to people who suffered from things like dyslexia. But they were yeah. generally very, very cruel, and yeah, generally I say they very, were nice words. Yeah, I mean, nice. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to use any, but I can, I, I, I have friends who, you know, same age as me, who were in school, and they were labelled, and the labels basically said, "You are not someone who is going to be a functional part of society mm -hmm. above anything other than, you know, labourer." Which is on a, just on construction. Yeah. And I mean, I've mentioned before, you know, the, the guy who, uh, when I started my university degree, age 18, he was 33. And he had, had left school at age 14. So I mean, I started my degree in 1988. So he would have been, uh, I can't do the maths for that. Yeah. He left school you know, nearly 20 years before that. So, you know, 1968. He left school in 1969. He left school, mm. age 14, and basically told, you are thick. You're only good enough to be a labourer and a brickie in the construction industry. Wow. Not that there's anything wrong with that as a career, 
No. Yeah, but that was that was kind of basically he was but told, told that is your you limit. Do. That is all you are possible to do. Yeah. That's and that's yeah, that's as far as I know, I, I I don't know how good he was at, at that, but as far as I know, he was he was reasonably successful. But he yeah, he, he knew that wasn't yeah, he wasn't satisfied with that. And when he discovered age kind of early twenties that he was dyslexic, a term that he had never heard before and was not even then. I mean, early twenties, you know, we're still talking in sort of the, the, the late 1970s. And he's told, you know, oh God, the mid 1970s. Yeah. There's this term coming out for something that explains why he struggled to read and write. Mm -hmm. And it's the time when computers are starting to become available for use i mean yeah i mean if you look back at the computers from the 1970s 1980s that were available in colleges and schools they were crude mm. but they helped him mm. and he now has a phd in nuclear physics and has worked at places like cern that's amazing, amazing that's story. <laughs> and i think the, the, i was really, right I was help, really worried yeah. this story was not gonna have a happy ending <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In those days, yeah, some of these yeah, these differences were used to suggest a difference in intelligence. And that difference in intelligence, I think, was usually down to the inability of those people to access the, the education as it was delivered at that time. Mm. And to a certain extent, it's still mm. happening today. I, I don't want to go on an education rant, mm. but I, yeah, I know that there are shortfalls in the British education system for people who are neurodiverse. The Western education system, yeah, is yeah. The US is, uh, totally. The US, totally. And Canada, Definitely. and lots of places um, the West are just yeah, as the, bad. The, there are short there are shortcomings in it, and, and some of that is yeah, and people often get labelled as you know, oh, of low intelligence yeah and it, it's it's i mean it's it's rubbish there is yeah, an important it, distinction there to make when um in when we're talking about um learning specific learning differences or specific learning difficulties which are you know our dyslexia our autism adhd and um learning disabilities and the yeah. those those distinctions are, are kind of important to make and the the textbook definitions are of learning disabilities are not pleasant but the reality is um that when we're talking about learning differences, ADHD, dyslexia, for example, um, we're not um, we're not referring. There's no link, link there at all to IQ, to intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And when we're talking about more profound learning disabilities, there can be more uh, yeah. more underlying sort of cognitive challenges there, um, and and the levels of support um, that are required are going to be you know potentially a lot more significant um absolutely in, in the, the day causes day and and things behind them tend to be very different things yeah. as well yeah absolutely um and mechanical kind of, versus why, development yeah. yeah and that term and that term disability you know overwhelmingly i mean you, you talk andy you talk about the, the the chap you knew um often um when people get a um a, a diagnosis of a of a learning difference um that can be that can be quite empowering. Um, it can things can sort of suddenly start to make make sense, and you can sort of understand yourself better. And often, when people go along a journey and they get appropriate support, um, they will start to see their learning difference as less, you know, potentially less of a, um, a hindrance or a challenge, or and sometimes more of an opportunity to um, and, and a, a series of strengths. Um, but that comes from from feeling empowered and understanding. That doesn't apply to everybody. Some people. Um, if you'd have asked me when I was 12, 13, I would have told you dyslexia was the like the worst possible thing that could have happened to me. Um, um, and but now I would say it's you know it, I see it's bringing me a lot more strengths than um, than it than it does challenges. Um, but a lot of that comes from that journey of going like okay I've, I I kind of recognise this in, in in myself now. Um, mm. And um, and in, in classic dyslexia memory fashion, I had a point I was going to make, and I've long since forgotten what it was because I've waffled. So, <laughs> I'd like to come back. I'd like to come back to the strengths that, that some of these differences can make with people. But Delani, I'd like to get back to you. I mean, you've you've, you've mentioned you're dyslexic, uh, ADHD. Yeah. Think you're possibly autistic. But yeah. as you haven't been a guest on previously, I'm, yeah, I'd like. To, uh, hopefully, you're you're, you're going to come back and be a, an individual guest, so we can kind yeah. of you know, get to know you better anyway. But for the benefits of those who don't 
know you or your work. Could you perhaps yeah. sort of share with us you know, what you've been doing over the last kind of year, few years and what yeah. you're about to do? Because I think that might be kind of useful for people to know kind of you know, how those purposes that you have fit in with actually what you're doing and have done and are about to do. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll guess I'll start from the beginning. So, um, <laughs> so, so I'll start from, uh, I don't know where to start. Okay, GCSEs. So I got my GCSE yep. results. My parents wanted me to go into the medicine routes because Asian culture, community, they're like doctor, you know, lots of money. And basically everyone, all the girls in the family become a doctor and boys become an engineer. And then when I got my results, computing and maths was like, you know, the grace that I got, um, the better grace, I guess. And then I decided, okay, I'd want to take this further. And I also liked engineering and I wanted to do that. So I went to a UTC in an engineering specialized school. And that's where I studied chemist, um, computing, maths and engineering. So I really liked the practical side of things. I've never actually done anything practical in school. But then when I was going to the sixth form college, I did a lot of hands-on practical things and I can see myself enjoying enjoying this. And like we had the same engineering teacher for some of the modules and he picked out that there was something wrong with my writing style. And that was when oh. like I saw like a red, not not like a, that's when I saw like, you know, like he's the one that shouts, pointed at me, like you have something going on. And he spoke to me one-on-one -on -one saying, you know, like I know that your 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 like parents don't speak English, they, they're from the Sri Lankan background and you know, you were growing up without speaking English that much. So this might be the reason, but I think there is something going on and you should get tested. But I didn't really think about that. I was like, what is he saying? Like, I know that, you know, like, my English is not good, but I don't think I have something wrong with me. Definitely not dyslexia. So I was like, oh, just forget about it. Like he's calling me like stupid or dumb. Like, I'm going to ignore that and just mind my own business and not get tested at all. But after, <laughs> yeah, so I spent my, um, you know, like, you know, like time there uh, doing my A-levels. And I decided that university wasn't the option for me because I can't do textbook writing or reading, reading textbooks and watching lectures all day. I need something hands-on. So I did a degree apprenticeship. So after finishing uh, my levels, I did a degree apprenticeship. And then that's that. Then again, um, the, the private tutor that we had said the same thing. And I was like, fine, okay. He's like telling me that, you know, he's reading uh, my report and he was like, okay, there's something wrong. You should get it checked. But then this time like, we actually had someone at the uni that can basically diagnose you. And right. I was like, okay, fine. Fine, like exam season, I'm already struggling. This is too much for me. Let me just like go and get it checked. And um, then they told me that I was diagnosed with dyslexia and I might be with ADHD. So then that's when everything started like piecing, like going into pieces, like basically fitting the puzzle because I realized that, you know, this is the problem and this is basically the symptoms that I've been like dealing with all my life so things like reading so basically when something's on the board the, the words move around and then i'm just like oh this is normal that it was like a normal for me and no one really speaks about it so i never really talk about it out loud and same with i also found out that i had visual stress so i couldn't so on white paper the words vibrate up and down and then she put colored overlays on it. I was like, whoa, the words just stopped moving. That's amazing. And then uh. it just, I was like, wow, like 80 years of my life. Like, why did no teachers pick it up? Like, I thought primary school and secondary school was the time where, like, you know, they, you, you work closely with the teachers. Whereas when you get older, university, you know, you know, you attend lectures and things like that, but someone picked it up. And, then I got diagnosed with ADHD and it was quite severe. So I got it 99%. So 1% of it worse than me. So I'm just like, that doesn't yeah. make it any better. Like, 1%. So that was like, thanks. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Like at 22, I've got, like, you know, the, the news was that you're severely dyslexic, uh, 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 you have severe ADHD, but it's untreated because 
well, you know, you're not, not you're an adult now. You know, like if you were younger, they would have been able to treat it. But now you're an adult. It's you have to work through it. So that was really upsetting news. And I was and then I was like thinking, reflecting back at my life. I knew why I struggled so much at university, why I found it very hard to pay attention at lectures, because my mind would go to daydream land. Same with meetings. I could not control it. And then that's when medication was like the key like of you know turning that noise down in my mind so I, it was very hard when i had to say this news to my parents because asian culture similar to what you said 50 years ago it was like a, a weakness to their family so i wasn't able to you know like uh, confidently share to them uh and it was very awkward trying to have that conversation with my parents saying that you know like i got tested for this i'm I have a disability. And they're like, what disability? I can't see anything. What's wrong with you? Like, what happened? And I'm like, no, it's mental. Like, it's it's a learning disability. They're like, no, that no such thing exists. Like, don't say like this round to people, your relatives. This is embarrassing. And then I had to like properly sit down and let them know how serious this is and how I think my siblings might also have it because with dyslexia, it can be through genetics. And I'm pretty sure my dad has it, but ADHD as well is has strong genetic ties. Yeah, I'm pretty sure my dad has both, but I I don't think he would agree to you know get it checked up. But it was very difficult. And then I told them, but like, you know these are the symptoms, and I kind of like Google translated it so like they can read it in their language and understand exactly what's wrong with me. And I tried to explain to them that you know this is why I was like you know super energetic and hyperactive when I was younger. It was not because I was, you know, wanted to be rebellious. It was because of my ADHD. And I told them a lot of the things made sense because, uh, you know, like I've, I've got like notes down. So I wanted to say like having mood swings is a common thing. So one day you're like really motivated to complete all these tasks. And the next you're just like paralyzed and just want to sit there and have your burnt out moments and can't get yourself to move up or, or you know, do things. You just feel lifeless. So that is basically the journey of someone with ADHD. Medication does help, but I feel like for me, like when I took my first ever dose, it was like something. I was in another world. But then as I was increasing my doses, it like, you know, every month I had to increase my doses because I could feel like it wasn't doing anything anymore. And Sammy is doing a bit, but I'm like, I, I need this voice in my head to like you know reduce because it's very hard like if you think about a, a motorway for example and you think about like this like five lanes and cars are going through and like this traffic and that is basically my head like so many things going through that's why i have so many incomplete tasks and incomplete hobbies because i just like learning and i have all these hobbies but i don't finish it and i don't continue it because i want to do something new and if you see my social media, you would understand this because I do so many things because I want to learn. But then I so can't be like, I haven't been on social media for months because, you know, I need time for myself. Or, yeah, so that's just me. Like, I, I can be reckless and full of energy at times, but then I just want to be alone and away from people. And it's just like another thing as well, impulse buying. So I didn't feel like this. But, you know, it, people with ADHD, like, like, you know, they like to, like, things to give them adrenaline. So, you know, going to theme park, gambling, impulse dopamine. buying. It's, yeah. it's, it's the dopamine. It's the feel yeah. good, which yeah. adrenaline it, often causes. But, it, yeah, people like well, it, people it, That's with ADHD a lot of the background, it. isn't it? With a lot of the, the, the underlying condition with ADHD is, is essentially dopamine processing issues. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah dopamine don't... absorption. Like, yeah. it dopamine production like it there's there's mm. a problem with with the dopamines yeah and in, in, in the brains produce, yeah we don't create or produce like dopamine as normal people do so mm. the medication kind of helps with that but it's very very hard and with ADHD forgetful memory so when you have your impulse buying moments you'd kind of forget what you already have at home unless it's right in front of you you're going to buy the same thing again. So then I've noticed this, that I've got boxes and boxes of things like under my bed or stored somewhere. 
And when I'm cleaning, I'm in my cleaning moment where I'm trying to procrastinate and avoid doing something, I would clean and then realize, oh, I've got so many things. I should stop buying things. So I would just display it in front of me to make me aware that, you know, I've got this stuff. Like, you know, stop spending money on things you don't need. Have so you ever done that where you where you buy something and you, you order it from like China or something and you know it's going to take three yeah. weeks and then the following yeah. week you you think oh I should buy this again and then you you go to buy it on somewhere else and then you've ended up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but the thing is like when you order something as well like you get so excited for it to like arrive and I don't know if it's that feeling as well when you order something on Amazon you just like kind of avoid your tasks for a bit so that you know you can be there when the fossil arrives so it's just like yeah i waste so much time doing crazy and stupid things but then i realized it was because of my adhd that i do all this and i am trying to cope with it and i did kind of think like my dyslexia and adhd was a weakness and it like you know i struggled in university i didn't want to go back to it because of the effort because i feel like small time or the, for adhd like to do a task it requires you to do you to put a lot of energy into it. So you're not lazy. So if your mom tells you to clean or like sort your bedroom out, because my room is messy and I, I can I feel like I can work with a messy room and it's very hard when it's clean. But when she tells me to clean it, it's not because I'm lazy, it's because I can't physically get myself to do it. And that's what the ADHD or consultant di the person that diagnosed me said it. You're not lazy, it's because you can't get your brain to do it. So whenever I tell this to people, they're like, yeah, you're lazy. But I'm like, no, that's yeah. not true. If you had ADHD, you would understand like what we're going through. And then there's so many things I could say, like low attention spans at meetings, like, you know, going to loads of events. You would, like, you know, you'll like be there uh, when like the, like the first few like sentences, you'll be there and then you zone out. But then sometimes when you're, listen to an interesting conversation you have the urge to butt in not because you're rude it's because you don't want to forget what you want yes. to say so <laughs> then when you say yeah. it they're like what are you doing you're like you know i, I want to have to tell you right now because if i don't yeah. tell you right now i think I we're all going to talk over each other in this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just we yeah, like when, when I have a point to say, the whole time I'm thinking about it is my point. I'm ignoring what he's saying. I'm just like, I want to say, I want to say, I want to say. You can't pay attention until you say it. And then when the first comes in, I'm like, and then it's just like, oh, not good timing. So, yeah, we don't like understand the world that we're in. And we, I, I don't know, like, I feel like people call me like emotionless. It's not that. It's, 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 it's very hard for me to understand other people's emotions. And like, it's not my fault that I can't remember special birthdays or days. So someone could be like, oh, you know what today is? And I'm like, what, what is it? I don't know. And this could be a close member of your family. And then it's, it's like, you know, it's my birthday. And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot. I, I've like, got your this and everything, but I didn't know what day what it was. What month is it? <laughs> <laughs> Basically. And it's not because like, we don't care, we we do, but it's just that our brain can't, like, yeah, like our, the, the, our brain memory storage automatically deletes all the stuff that we need to remember for some reason. Like, people with ADHD don't have good RAM. Like, I was going to say, it's all in RAM, not shifting to hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I feel, like, I feel like the thing is not so much bad memory with ADHD. I feel like it's bad um, organization, like bad memory organization. Yeah. Because, like, I've learned that if you ask me what my favorite movie is, right? I have one. Yeah. I have several. Couldn't tell you right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. because that question, it, like, it doesn't latch in to the organ. It doesn't work with the... It's almost like my brain is in JavaScript and that was like a command and C. Like, it just is like, mm, I don't know. It, we yeah. have no answer to this request. But if... The compile error. Pretty yeah. much. Um, but if you, if you ask me a yes, no question, if you ask me what I think about a thing, like, like, Ali, have you ever seen the movie Moulin Rouge? Did you like it? 
I could then be like, oh yeah, that's one of my favorite films. And here's an yeah. essay, a 42 page <laughs> essay as to why. Um, yeah, yeah. It, the memory is there. In fact, I, I've figured out that my memory is actually remarkable, particularly for certain things. It's just the way those memories are stored and the way I access them. Those Someone's taken work. the index card out and rubbed all the page numbers off. Yeah, like it's yeah. it's so weird. I was I was in central London yesterday and we walked past a hotel and I suddenly remembered that I'd been there before. I remembered the people I was there with, like I remembered the event I was there for, like but if you'd asked me about this thing on 10 minutes prior, I wouldn't have remembered that that was a thing that I'd ever done. Um, yeah. But like in that, I, I'm very curious because I'm not dyslexic. If dyslexia is visually based, because um, mm. it sounds like from the way y'all are describing it, that it is, there's a visual component to dyslexia. So I mean, there's this, <laughs> this, yeah, I mean, this, so this, this idea of, um, so I guess it's a really core thing. It's that's certainly relevant to dyslexia and has lots of crossover with other learning differences is this idea of like the speed of processing information. So, um, the, so that can be visual information. It can be sort of, um, you know, sort of written word. Um, so one, so I one thing, that is visual. I think, I think that yeah. the written word is input is a visual input. Yeah. So if we like take, if we take that, something. Yeah. Yeah. So if we take that example of, um, of like filing things away in your, I use, use the, the hard drive analogy, Jamie. Um, I, I was like, when I'm talking about my memory, I always talk about the context of, we're talking about working memory. So, mm -hmm. so if you, um, say, um, you know, is my, my boss and she gives me five tasks to do. Um, I basically, if I didn't write them down, I would probably remember like two of them at the best, yeah. like, mm -hmm. um, but, so they initially initially go into my short term memory, and then my working memory is the way I sort of manipulate them and store them in my brain's filing cabinet, my hard drive for later. Oh, yeah. um, and for for someone with dyslexia um, or ADHD, the amount of information that, um, or so the amount of time it might take to process that information to store it for later, or to to remember it, or to be able to um, I don't know, to, to to learn something new, um, might be might be more basically you need more time basically to, to be able to achieve that same task more processing processing time um and when when we're talking about um when we're talking about kind of neuro neurodiversity in a wider sense i've got a labrador just i was to gonna say, say hi luna, luna. <laughs> hi, she's luna. Coming, coming you can't actually see her but she's she's coming to say hello um hi, go away dog go in your bed go um when we're she's a good um, girl she's a good girl <laughs> um yeah, so when um, when I was doing like dyslexia stuff, I so we did a thing with um, we did dyslexia training for all the job centres in Cornwall, and one of the things um, one of the things that job centres encounter a lot is they they often encounter people who are who are you know maybe really struggling financially or they're unemployed or they might have um, drug or alcohol challenges, um, and there's an overrepresentation of um, neurodivergent people um, among among people who are who are unemployed. Um, so what people in the job centers, which are pretty horrible places anyway, um, or often, often find is that people were receptive to some degree, and then it's like a brick wall comes down. So suddenly someone, someone's like, you know, quite put, they're pushing back or they might seem rude or obnoxious. And, um, and, um, that's like a really, that's like a really relevant thing to think about when we're talking about neuro, neurodiversity, because basically if you have dyslexia or autism or ADHD, the amount of information it takes before this sort of feeling of a brick wall comes down can be much less. Um, so like lots of people, like pretty much anyone who um, has, everyone who has experienced this feeling of being of like cognitive overload where your brain is just, mm. uh, um, I guess the classic analogy is like, you know, so you're in the car and you're screaming kids in the back or you, I don't know, you had an argument with a partner or whatever, and it can feel like you're just seething, your brain is like, you're no, just overload. And we've all kind of experienced that. But for people with um, with neurodiversity, the amount of information can be much, much less. So an example mm -hmm. I would give of that for me, my dyslexia doesn't really affect my reading and writing, but um, I can think of a time where I was in the queue at the bank and I was having a really like stressful day and I was really kind of overwhelmed. And I got to the front of the queue at the bank and the lady handed me a, um, a form and I had to write my name on the form and I couldn't, I couldn't like think of the letters to write my name but my dyslexia doesn't affect 
my reading and writing. But in that moment, this sort of cognitive overload put me in a place where I was really severely affected by my dyslexia and I couldn't do a really simple task. Um, Which and, then snowballs. Um, yeah, absolutely. So in your analogy of like, you know, the ball, the, the, the big, the boulder rolling down the hill yeah. is really relevant in that scenario. Um, and it's suddenly like, oh, I'm exhausted and I still have to push the boulder. Oh, hey, it's starting yeah. to roll back on me now. Yeah, massively so. And then, the, and then that, that brings yeah. relevance to, to what Andy was talking about with, um, with, um, with a kind of education stuff. So if we take, so it's one, one in seven people are neurodivergent, uh, but one in 10 people are dyslexic. Um, but if, but if we take um, just dyslexia in the context of um, like young offenders institutions and, and prisons in the UK, there are some prisons in the UK where 50% of the prison population are dyslexic. Now, that doesn't mean that you're, if you're dyslexic, you're more likely to commit a crime. Um, the research in that, in that area looks at this idea of sort of route to offending, which starts with people in school feeling like their true abilities aren't recognized and acknowledged. Mm. That can lead to resentment, mm. problems of authority. People, feeling it's a failure. Yeah, people mm. turn to less legitimate ways of making money. Um, yeah. and, and actually, and you get scenarios where people, people get this sense of like the brick wall coming down and they kind of push back and it's um yeah so like we've we've got there's a lot of sort of kind of cultural trauma around the way people were treated at school and the way um i mean delana you touched on touched on your um on your dad and i in the context of, of you know, my own family and, and friends and stuff it's like we we as um you know our generation and then you know our kids generation or whatever they're there's a there's a lot of stuff that's been handed down from it wasn't that long ago I guess uh, Andy in the context of your your friend you know it's you know our my parents generation um you know were a generation where we were basically if you were severely dyslexic you were basically beaten at school and told that you were stupid and you were worthless and you never amount to anything and that yeah. you know that trauma is present in people that we're interacting with in our in our daily lives yeah, I, I I don't know the actual like numbers, but I I seem to recall seeing in multiple places that like the um the overlap of autism and like PTSD or trauma is almost a hundred percent because mm -hmm. you almost can't avoid have being being exposed to this to some kind of ill treatment at some point, but more likely multiple points in your life mm -hmm. um because of just yeah the i guess going jamie you asked such a good question you know is it people is it systems it's both but the systems are so much more profound i think in many ways because they are not yeah. built for the, the ironic thing is that they're built for such a narrow narrow group like it's such a small group of people because i actually think that the reality is is like to go back to the whole like you have the normal and not normal and and a hundred years ago it probably looked like these are the normal people and these are the not normal people because yeah. mm. there was a huge group in the middle of people who were not normal who for, for people listening i did very big air quotes for that because i need to be very <laughs> clear um about my use of this this term um but were able to hide it we're able mm. to mask, we're able to adapt and to convince themselves, perhaps, um, even that they were in, in, the, in the normal group. Um, and over time, I don't think the number of people who are neurodiv neurodivergent has really changed. I think it really is just a matter of more people are feeling able to and empowered, perhaps, to recognize and uh, you know address these things speak about them openly I, in, yeah. I guess in, in, in the same way that i i genuinely believe that there is not suddenly an uptick in trans people there's just more people talking about it they've yeah. always been around just hide, hit it you know it's when more visible, it was this yeah. sort of thing that you know there was literally zero accommodations for so it's it's interesting to me partially because for genuinely many, many years of my life, I would have looked you straight in the eye and told you that, no, I'm, I'm not neurodivergent. Like, I, I, I don't have any of the classic signs, you know? And, and the thing is, is I wouldn't have been lying to you. And I wasn't even necessarily lying to myself because I, it was all I knew. 
and I had convinced myself of this because I had no other, there was, there was no other real option presented to me, I guess it felt like. Um, but it is interesting how um, making accommodations and, and making changes now, doing the things that we're, I guess, trying to do collectively now to make things different um, really does make a difference. And I, and I say this partly as somebody who is currently um, applying for a grant and I have accessed the access need, like the access <laughs> one. And I have, for the first time in my entire life, I have somebody whose entire job is to help make this easier for me. Mm. I've never had this. And I am frequently like, oh my God. Do, do you often is think to yourself, am, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to ask this question? Or, or am I allowed to have this help? Is, is this it's cheating? Like an imposter, an imposter syndrome for your is own... This, your is, well, partially because this person is so, so kind and so gentle and so nice and is asking all of the right questions. And like at one point, like we were having a, a like a call, like a Zoom call, and he started saying things that I was like, oh, shit, I should be writing these things down. And he was like, oh, no, don't worry about it. I'm going to take notes and I'm going to email these to you after our meeting. And I was like, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I don't have to twist myself into a pretzel. Honestly, this is, I've been wanting to apply for this grant for over a year. And the reason why I haven't is because every time I would look at the website, I would look at the what was required for it, I would become so overwhelmed um, by the prospect of it that I just was like, nope, sorry, never mind. I, I, that was silly of me to think that I could do this. Um, and it's so simple and straightforward to him. <laughs> But he's now letting me have access to that through him. And it's wild. It's it's genuinely just like the coolest thing. <laughs> so yeah, like it's it's there is it is not oh my god, it is not a lack of intelligence. Christ, it's not a lack of intelligence. It's I don't think it ever has been. It's it is it is truly that access to things in the right way that makes sense to you. Which again is not going to be the same for everyone. Um, I want to pick, I want to pick on a couple of the points if I, if I can. I, 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 something on Sean said and, and something you've said, and I think this gives you. So Sean gave us some figures. Yeah, one in seven um, people are, are neurodiverse. Yeah, one in ten being dyslexic. So obviously you can think about the rest. And you're talking there about some intelligence, and it's something that's been mentioned a couple of times before. I think perhaps you, I, this might be a point for me to kind of sort of mention my neurodiversity again purely self self-diagnosed I've, I've never been through the system i mean i i went through certainly my kind of early years of school extremely successful yeah very very high functioning academically um i started to struggle for, for, for a variety of reasons I, i've talked a little bit about this on thoughts on the tinkerage um kind of post o levels i'm, I'm old enough to have done o levels What's an O level? Sorry. Ordin ordinary level. So you've got A levels, advanced yeah. level. Yeah, I know that one. So it's before old GCSEs. GCSEs, before GCSEs, there were ordinary levels. Oh. So general certificates in education, ordinary level. Um, I learned the thing today. So they 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 finished in 87, 88. Um, and then GCSEs came in. So I yeah, I I'm very successful at, at O level, at uh, A level. Less so for a variety of reasons that you know there's there some family issues and yeah I I started to struggle with with things like exams and and focus and concentration but I I just I mean part of it, it was put down to uh, I mean I've mentioned before my mum died when I was sixteen and yeah it was put down my teachers basically oh, we're not gonna we're not gonna bother him we're not gonna push him we're not gonna say this isn't good enough because you're you're better at that and I was given I was I have when I went to university, I basically went on a, an unconditional. It, it was conditional, two E's. That was that was my entry requirement for university, because mm -hmm. yeah, there was a recognition that I was I was very high performing, very very intelligent, and so I was kind of. I mean, I I, I don't really want to go into kind of you know, the some of the struggles that I had in school, and I had plenty of struggles, particularly socially. Um, yeah, give me give me a science book, give me a math book. Yeah, no problem at all. And I was I was good with English. I was, I was yeah, I 
definitely not dyslexic very high reading age uh i think I had, when i was nine I, I was assessed for the reading age of 15 or 16. um so i was reading well above my kind of age my, my biological age and I, I you know went to university didn't do as well at university i, I, I discovered outdoor sports and and beer um and so I didn't do as well at university. And I, I, I noted then at university that my memory worked very well for knowing where information was. I can find information very quickly. I know exactly where my notes are. I can tell you, yeah, if there's something, I mean, I've got dozens and dozens of physics books. Yeah, I've got, there's, there's, there's probably a, at least a dozen, if not 20 books on the shelf behind me. There's probably another 30 or 40, probably even sort of closer to a hundred books on bookshelves upstairs. And I can, if, if somebody says, oh, I, I, there's, there's a book and it's got something in it, I can find it. I can find it really quickly. And I can use that information. I can use that information really well. So I did very well at university on things like uh, laboratory work, writing reports, but come to exams. Yeah, I know which folder that's in. And I can find that page very quickly, but yeah, I can do anything with it. But yeah, went off into industry, then into education. Yeah, spent 20 years as a teacher. And it was probably, yeah, again, high performing. I've, yeah, I've been assessed by all sorts of people, including the, the MOD on kind of yeah, intelligence levels. And yeah, yeah, I've had people in the MOD go, you're very intelligent. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, if, if people that are kind of yeah, very high ranking in the MOD saying, yeah, you're intelligent. I'll take that. Very thank you very much. Um, but then... I noticed, I think probably 2008, 2009, I was, I was head of science in a school that actually specialised in, they had a, a, a Asperger's, again, using that, that term, a facility specifically. For, they had about 20 students uh, that were classified as, as Asperger's. So that's the one of the extreme ends of the autistic spectrum. And I think that there's a key point, again, as well, I want to make, yeah, a lot of what we're talking about today are, are spectrum, spectrum sorry, differences. Yeah, yeah there, there's a range, yeah, Somebody can be dyslexic, or autistic, uh, dyspraxic, it, and ADHD, and it, it, there's a range of possible differences that they may show or experience, and that, that, that that's quite key. And I can remember sitting in a, we had a, a specific training day specifically about kind of, you know, working with students with uh, neuro differences. And I'm sitting there at the start, very start of the day, and we've got somebody talking who's yeah, a, a, a renowned expert, uh, not not a big name in terms of things, just sort of locally, you know, well recognised within the kind of the, the local authority um, as being kind of yeah, the the, the go-to person to deal with things like autistic spectrum disorders and differences. And go, going through a list, and they're going through a list, and I'm going, yeah, that's me. Yep, that's me. And I ticked all bar about three of the boxes. And I'm thinking, yeah, and they, 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 they talked about kind of, yeah, yeah, most of you in the room here are probably going to tick some of the boxes because some of those things are things that any person can mm -hmm. experience, even people that are neuro, neurodivergent or people with that are neurotypical. And they will tick some of those boxes. There will be things that kind of, you know, they, they struggle with just on a day-to-day -day basis or they find annoying or the like. And it's like, but I, I actually spoke to them sort of later and said, yeah, there's my list. And they went, yeah, <laughs> you're probably, and I, I'm, I, was, I was 38. I said, yeah, you, you, you're probably autistic. And yeah, so what's your subject? Uh, physics. Yeah. That, that, that probably fits, yeah, yeah. And here, yeah, it, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a joke, yeah. There's a lot of physicists who kind of, yeah, would be recognised on the spectrum, yeah. Uh, the autistic the spectrum. There's plenty that's not as well, plenty that aren't. And I kind of like, I sort of tuck this information away, and it's like, okay, but, yeah, in the, the institutional career that I had, actually, yeah, I had this, yeah, I... I had developed the skills and I developed these things. But yeah, maybe some of my close colleagues would kind of go, yeah, 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 Andy, yeah, you are, yeah, uh, definitely you're autistic. Yeah. And, but yeah, majority of other people would just go, no, he, he is, but he's functioning, yeah, he's a physics teacher, yeah, he's, 
leather patches on his jacket, the, the like. But then actually, you know, kind of leaving education, leaving years, four years ago, leaving education, leaving that institutionalized career. And I'm actually kind of, and th this is kind of you know, part of the reason why it's this, you know, discovering the maker community. Yeah, you know, not just kind of the maker movement. I knew about the maker movement, but actually discovering the maker community and discovering other the people. Actual people like, like the movement, not just the movement itself. Yeah, and not just kind of you know, not just woodworkers, or just you know, not just people who kind of follow one particular thing. They go to their shed and they turn their lathe on, or they go to their shed and they, yeah, they make toy cars or automator or whatever. But yeah, find kind of these makers who kind of yeah, oh yeah, the, I mean, Delaney, you were talking about kind of your yeah, incomplete yeah hobbies and things. I was kind of wanting to kind of put my hands up to try and hide some of the stuff that's behind me. <laughs> yeah, that just got me. Yeah, no, that, and yeah, actually, kind of. You're yeah, putting together more and more. Again, after self-diagnosis, I'm fairly confident now that if I went for a formal diagnosis, and to be honest, I probably won't because I can't get medicated because of medication that I'm on. Um, yeah, I'm I'm ADHD as well as on the autistic spectrum. Well, to to interject a moment, though, that, that's. Like Ali mentioned before about the, um, you know, the, the kind of the stimulant medication is the, the one path of treatment. Um, yeah. But the other kind of path of treatment for uh, a lot of these things is cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm. And it's it's learning coping strategies. It's learning Defense where you're different and how exactly that. Or to um, work with them, shall we say. To work, to, to that's, work with I, them, yeah. I would say that's something that, yeah, I have put into place over the last 45 years. And that, yeah. that is exactly the, the problem that a lot of people struggle uh, with coming to a realization that they might have some kind of neurodivergence is that uh, institutionalized kind of rigorous f need to mask or to find ways to fit in. Mm. And e even, you know, um, again, you know, it, it's become almost like a trope, but the fact that dyslexia is a difficult word to spell and you know the adhd you have to remember to get in touch with people over the phone which is a problem that people with executive dysfunction uh, really struggle with uh you know or remembering appointments that you have to go to or things like that or with autism uh, you know or, or any of the autism spectrum disorders to deal with people or ask for help or things that you know all of the pathways surrounding help and treatment and diagnoses are put together by people who are neurotypical and don't yeah. necessarily fully understand they're highly the inaccessible to the people they're supposed to help absolutely yeah you, you i'm really interested in this sorry go for it. no go on Sean. go for it i'll say i'm really interested in the thing that andy touched on in, in, in relation to what um Delaney, Delaney was saying about um like the different hobbies and stuff and like in the context of the maker community because i'm 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 convinced in my context that my ability to be really distracted and to start things and to not um and and not finish things and stuff is like is the thing that makes me like a better maker because it's like a the, this like i feel like i feel like my sort of neurodivergent superpower is to be this sort of jack of all trades because i just get excited by so many different things that yeah um i mean i yeah for uh, for, for those who i guess you haven't watched seen me or my friend ruth on on here before um we build primary school kids inventions so kids drill their ideas they send them to us and every month we build one friggin so awesome single... <laughs> yep. yeah and, and ali's been been on a video yeah. before yeah um, kicked your butt too yeah, you, you, you <laughs> tiny finger cutlery, cutlery you wear on your fingers, and then we went to a restaurant and it was actually with, highly functional. Yeah. It was um, too functional. Yours worked really, really well. Um, but every single month we have to build um, a completely different, like, mad idea, and it's the fact, or the fact, basically, that I can't, I couldn't do a normal job, um, and I just <laughs> get so distracted. Is a thing that make that that makes me good at like solving problems. Um, mm. And I was interested, Delaney, like, do you feel the same that your like ability to be sort of sporadic and all over the place helps you when it comes to making stuff? Yeah, basically. I feel like being like that makes me 
not boring, but when I compare myself to people that like work, sleep, they have a routine, like get out, eat, work, sleep, relax, sleep. Whereas with me, I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. like it's always like things to get me going. And I just do things at my own pace and feel like doing whatever I want. So I don't have rules, but I try to be organized, I guess, because you know, that phone call or the appointments, I don't want to miss, there's events. So I would like put that on a plan, but yeah, I feel like being like me is, I don't know. I feel like I'm in the moment being alive. I don't know how to explain it, but I think you, that's you how just, I feel. You just have to learn how to channel it. I really do mm. believe that. I really think that something like these sorts of things really can be like a superpower if you learn how to embrace and lean into them and not fight them because i know for me it was a matter of not necessarily trying to force myself to do things that i wasn't feeling like i like i kind of could do um because at any given time i've got a friggin laundry list of things that i need to do but what has made me go from somebody who was an incredibly inefficient um, person to somebody who is perhaps not working on things the way most people do, but is incredibly efficient with their time, is I stopped trying to force myself to do the things that I feel like I need to do and allow myself most of the, as much as I can, as much as I can within reason, allow myself to do the things that I feel compelled to do when I am compelled to do them. And then eventually, for the most part, everything kind of gets done. It might not get, and because that's the thing, I'm not ever working on a single thing from start to finish. I'm working on five things simultaneously. So everything takes longer. However, my time is in, incredibly efficient in that I am frequently working at a high capacity because I'm allowing myself to work on the thing that I feel interested in and passionate about in that moment. So like, and, and it is for that reason that I have both fabric shears, a pile of cut up fishing line and some LEDs on my desk next to me all at once. Some of these things are related, some of them aren't. Um, because those were the things that I wanted to work on. And so that was all progress on something. A progress meter moved forward on several things this week. Was it all one thing? No, God, no, haha, <laughs> doing one thing all week, that's silly. Um, and were there things that I really should have worked on that I didn't? Yes, like for sure. There's usually something I'm behind on a little bit, but the other thing is that if I actually allow my brain to do the thing that feels good most of the time, it's a lot easier to then one day a week or whatever, be like, all right, we really got to do admin or, you know, mm -hmm. we really got to yeah. write this thing, do this thing that is less exciting. My brain doesn't rebel as much because it got to do the things it wanted to do most of the week. And so like I work together with my brain and, and it's, idiosyncrasy is much better because I stopped fighting it. Um, and, and honestly, that does feel like a superpower because like I watch, I watch people, I watch people incredibly. The reason I survived, I got through school and all that stuff without being, you know, clocked is because my special interest is people. <laughs> my <laughs> special interest is literally all y'all. Um, so I just kind of, I absorb people really well and as a result I am now like scarily empathetic and very very good at pretending to be human <laughs> I, I play a great one on tv um <laughs> and and so like I, I watch people all the time I find people fascinating and I see how incredibly hilariously inefficient most people are working under the standard model of capitalism. Like they might work a couple hours a day. And, but of course they look like they're working, you know, eight hours mm -hmm. a day because that's important. You gotta look, look like you're busy, but they aren't actually like their, their brain is shutting down. 
for a good chunk of the day. Which is why those studies like on the four day working week find that actually in some industries, people mm. become more, more productive when they work yep. less. Yeah, yeah, because they aren't yeah. actually working all that time. They just look like they are because everyone has figured that out. Everyone has figured out. How to work. <laughs> um, like again, this capitalism necessitated that, but I'd like it as a funny sort of comparison. And I have actually cited this um, to, to people, to people looking to, to, um, is it, is the word elicit my pro professional services? Is that the word? Mm -hmm. I can't remember now. That's the word. Yeah. Um, that basically I am actually, uh, like, I, I, I wouldn't say that like I work at super speed, but like, I'm just incredibly efficient with my time. It's just in a way that is not typical. It's just not mm -hmm. in the standard fashion so it's like don't give me a single task and expect that to be immediately done but like yeah. my time is very well spent because mm. i'm doing something that my brain is excited to do and uh, again like like many of y'all have said i love to learn and take in new information so if it's something that like is this sort of thing i'm gonna do it way like I'm, I'm gonna do it at a surprising pace and i'm gonna spend eight hours probably doing it and forget to eat um which is not necessarily a good thing um yeah. this is why having having helper humans is also useful who are like ally the food the food now <laughs> yeah. the, the food yeah. ally um but um, it is yeah it's it's not it's not it doesn't have to be a hindrance it doesn't have to be but it it does take acceptance and that is hard if you aren't in the environment or if you aren't privileged enough to be able to step outside of systems somewhat um to be able to do things in a way that actually works for us or if those systems are constructed in a way that that doesn't yeah that almost is like battling you and that's yeah. the, that's the sad reality, mm. you know. When you talk about, you know, we take take your example, Andy, of your of your friend. It's like, you know, there was a time when we literally told kids in schools, our education system literally told kids in schools they were stupid and they were lazy. And thankfully, that doesn't happen now. But uh, we do all, we are all social creatures, yeah. and we naturally compare ourselves to those around us. And there's an yeah. awful lot of young people who feel like they're stupid they're lazy because 90 percent of their ability is being assessed on the basis of their literacy skills and their memory um their ability you know, to I, take yeah. tests their ability yeah. to take tests which only tests your ability to take tests yeah absolutely and it's it, still and happening now... it's it's i would i would argue that it's still happening yeah uh, and i would say it's yeah. particularly Less, it's different. particularly noticeable in areas where we have the selective systems the grammar schools yeah, yeah. because yeah, yeah Yes, the majority of students in the grammar schools do very well. Mm. Not all, but yeah, and you, you can look at the you know, failures with individual schools and, and whatever. But, you know, in the majority of grammar schools, somebody getting into a grammar school will achieve well. But the, the other 80% of the kids in that area who have either chosen not to even attempt the 11 plus exam or have failed the 11 plus exam at the age of 10, 11 years old, consider themselves a failure and stupid. Good God. And, and, that, and that's an unfortunate too. reality of the, the selective school system. Yeah. Now, as a teacher, I spent you know, two thirds, three quarters of my career in, in grammar schools. Right. And as a teacher, don't get me wrong, I loved teaching grammar schools. Yeah, I was able to teach, I didn't have to crowd control. I was able to take students to, I was able to share my subject. I was able to take students to a level of you know, engagement in a variety of things, whether it was you know, physics or whether it was things like first Lego league and, you know, do things that having worked in secondary modern schools, the high schools, yeah, you know, in grammar school areas, that wasn't always possible. But then I've also worked in those secondary modern schools and you know, I've worked with children who are, you know, were in bottom set. And I've literally had a you know, class that I took on when they, they were starting year 10. Uh, so we're talking kind of you know, 14 years old. Uh, so the last two years of essentially the, the compulsory education, although it's now 19, but you know, it's kind of... Yeah. So, and literally had a student tell me, 
But sir, we are stupid. They had been told so many times, not directly, but over the years, that they were not capable. That they were stupid. And yet, actually, kind of, yeah, giving them the right opportunities, giving them the right yeah, help, giving them cho the right choice of exam courses. And they were able to actually achieve well. And you get, yeah, I, I, I still use it as, when, when you do kind of, uh, teacher interviews, yeah, you, you get asked things like, yeah, give an example of a class where things didn't go so well, and yeah, what did you do to kind of yeah, sort it out? And I, I, I've still, for many years, I used that example of a class where I took them on in the, for the first year I had them following the course that you know, everyone else, they, they'd just been on you know, course four. And it was a struggle, it was hard, they were struggling. And then I kind of, because I was head of faculty, I was able to go, this cannot carry on, we can't, I cannot do another year like this, they cannot do another year like this changed the course, made it coursework accessible, used an exam board that were very clear about how students could achieve. That was the, and used, I used language then with them that made it accessible for them. I said, look, we're going to do an experiment. If you do this, you can get these many marks and that will put you this grade. If you do a little bit more, you get these many marks and you'll get that grade. And you look at students who've never achieved above an E grade in their life, saying, we can get a C, you can get a B. Mm. Um, going, yes, you can if you do this. And then they would work. So like we'd be taking uh, like stress strain measurements that, yeah, A level students would kind of go, oh, he's boring. And they would do that for three solid weeks to get enough data. And they would then present that, yeah, analyze that data, present that data, and they're going to go, right, okay, if I do that, tick that box off, I got it, yeah, that's a D. If I do this bit and this bit, I get a C, I tick this bit off, I get a B. And they're like, I, they can do it. But it was just taking that uh, out of the achievable goal, the, the typical system. And yeah, I mean, that particular school, I left that school in 2009. Okay, so we're talking yeah, 13 years ago now. But it, things haven't changed in the last 15 years. That's a it's scary still, thing. That's a scary mm -hmm. thing is that, you know, we talk about the, the kind of societal, you know, terms like neurodiversity and, and the societal understanding of like, oh, there are some people who are dyslexic and there are some people who have ADHD mm -hmm. and some people with dyspraxia. It's like those things, they are there. there, there is such, such, such a greater understanding. And yet we are the, the four more structures of education that, um, that are kind of aren't, just aren't keeping up really. And in some ways they're going, you know, they're going, backwards a little bit so if we take the example of um you know we've now got a situation in the uk where um seven-year-olds are sitting you know formal assessments formal exams um mm -hmm. and they're told yeah. that those exam results you know that are there just for the school and stuff but their parents find out what the results are so there's pressures being put on a seven-year-old to um and we're seeing that in in mental health services that are more and more yeah. young young children experiencing mental health challenges because of stress yeah. and pressures at school now, if we take, if we're talking about neurodiversity, well, if you're dyslexic, um, you can't be, you can't be assessed for, um, for your dyslexia until you're seven or eight. So you're sitting, mm -hmm. you, you know, you've started school much younger, you've started school at five and you're, um, and you're basically having this whole period of where you're being, you know, quite rigorously and formally assessed before you're even able to sit a test to see yeah. if you're, you've got a, a, a challenge. Um, yeah. And you compare that with like the UK education system of like Finland, where kids don't go to school until they're seven. Um, yeah. And and then you, know, you sort of, you know, there's all the other indicators of, you know, Finland has, is like the highest performing comprehensive school system in the world. They're the most literate nation in the world. And you go, well, maybe, maybe some of that stuff actually works quite well. Um, I was listening to a really good podcast this morning. Um, it was talking about the, um, uh, it was talking about it was actually it was all about like um class structures and and actually whether there's whether there's a value in in us talking about like you know where you know the idea of people in middle class and working class and and whether actually there's a there's whether whether those terms are have the potential to be empowering rather than just old-fashioned um in the current context of things and they were talking about this idea of um when we're talking about trauma you know people people having you know living in poverty um and you know, cost of living crisis and these sort of things those those can manifest as um, as people experiencing things that result in in lifelong trauma. Um, uh, but if you're, um, they were making the comparison um, uh, of actually we don't often talk about the trauma of um, of those who are perhaps making decisions in our government. 
that if you basically were shipped off to a boarding school at the age of five uh, mm. and you end up going to, you know, and that was, and you may you maybe end up going to Eton and you had this potentially really traumatic childhood where you were basically, you didn't grow up with your children, with your parents. And you were basically, you know, you went to a very exclusive school where, you know, very expensive bills and stuff, but you were basically, you know, that was a very traumatic experience where you weren't, um, you weren't parented and you were, um, it was a very competitive and a very sort of you know, driven, pushy environment. And then you find yourself in a position of government where you're making decisions um, about the education system for the masses. It's like, how can you be expected to firstly understand that system when you weren't yeah. part of it? But also you might be coming at it from the perspective of being someone who's actually quite damaged because of their own experience of the education system. Um, and Ali used that word privilege. It's like, actually, we're all sat here having a conversation as kind of sort of middle class people with some degree of privilege um, where we can create our careers and our, our, our direct our education um, mm -hmm. and, and make those decisions with with some degree of support and understanding of ourselves. But if you're someone who's basically left school at 16 because you felt like you didn't belong there um, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're basically having to work a minimum wage job just to get by, you don't have the potentially have the capacity to um, to self-educate or self-diagnose um, around around neurodiversity. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we're we're massively missing out on a huge proportion of the population who could be amazing makers, engineers, inventors and solving at a time basically we've got climate crisis we've got so many global problems that we need as many yeah. like diverse brains to help solve and we're we're like systematically failing loads of people who could be like the you know the, the next big people who are going to solve those problems and they're just not given the, the advantage to do so yeah, yeah. and that's yeah, a yeah. big part of why we are where we are right now because we've had the same types of people in charge and making the decisions and having the ideas and pushing things forward for the last hundred years and, and uh, I their ideas crazy, don't tend to change yeah. and i think the, 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 the crazy thing is and we put people up on that one of the the things with with people that are neurodivergent is that often sometimes i can't get a figure to it yeah, there's there's a I mean, we, the term has been used already. Yeah, a, a superpower that, mm. that might actually deliver fully, whether it's that ability to hyper focus on something that's very complex. Yeah, often found in, in I mean, you hyper focus, you know, often it's a common trait within ADHD, autism. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's often that ability to kind of focus on something that no one else wants to focus on or is mm. even able, and sometimes able to focus on. Um, or yeah, they're, I mean, they're bringing multiple skills in because we all generally want to train up in as many different things as possible. So we might have a unique perspective. Yeah, a unique Bring perspective from something yeah. else that isn't part of the neurotypical standard sort of, you know, whether we're saying like the Etonian template of thou shalt be like this, you know, having some completely left field well, there's that. Idea. I mean, that 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 phrase, you know, the jack of all trades, that Sean used earlier. Mm. Yeah, it's often thrown out as an insult, and but it's it's yeah, you know, it's, it's the missing trade. the rest of the actual the passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, jack of all trades is it, you know, master of none. Mm. It. I grew up thinking that was that was an insult. Yeah, I considered myself a bit of a jack of all trades, although I was quite focused on sort of STEM type things as a kid. But that kind of jack of all trades, it was it was always seen as a bit of a almost a curse. It, yeah, mm. it was it was a, it was uh, it, it just a way of sort of describing somebody that was like, well, yeah, they're not actually very You're good. You're not good enough. One thing you don't do yeah. things. Yeah. Yet the rest of the phrase, yeah, jack of all trades, master of none, oftentimes better than a master of one. Yeah, not baby. that we don't sometimes need masters of one thing sometimes we need we need those people who are and and, and that kind of folds back on itself because sometimes we find uh, you, you again thinking about people with autistic spectrum um will often be very focused on one thing they may not be able to necessarily care for themselves yeah, yeah they do need somebody that's going to go right eat <laughs> but they will work on something without right. distraction and without focus on anything else. Yeah, you know, they don't worry about what they're wearing or what they're eating. You know, they mm -hmm. will just focus on something 
with a level of sophistication that is not achievable by most people. There's a reason why a lot of people in like high level engineering positions are like, I, yeah. I, again, I, I, I bet you if they did a real hardcore study, they'd find that a lot of those folks are neurodivergent. Yeah, because, the, the, yeah because they've got the right the, brains for that sort of work, you know? Yeah, and things like, you know, bipolar disorder being known as like the CEO's disease, you yeah. know, and things like that of, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of that kind of thing. And again, you know, like we've talked about before of, you know, pathways to diagnosis and things, you know, um, things like executive dysfunction, a huge number of CEOs and, you know, that level of kind of person tend to then have assistance. Uh, people who take care of the things that they are not very good at yeah. so then the don't wise. realize that they're not generally okay. good at it yeah because they the they have systems in place that take care of the stuff that they're not very good at it is amazing what you can do with somebody who is also at home cooking and cleaning you know like absolutely yeah. well, so th this was something i would have to, to do everything <laughs> opens up so many <laughs> doors and money <laughs> Money's great for, for doing things. <laughs> Amazing what you can accomplish. Um, Jamie, yeah. the, the, the thing I was wanting to talk about, something that you touched on earlier, I, that, well, I think we've, we've all kind of loosely touched on it, but the, the kind of the, the mass of different interests, the mass of unfinished projects, the mass of things that we procrastinate on, and specifically then the brain hacking that we do to adapt around that and i mentioned before being on the waiting list for an assessment myself but looking back over kind of times in my life when i've had you know these markers that i haven't twigged um i our sort of other friends podcast uh, two-thirds focused i was talking about procrastination specifically um, a couple of months back and remembered that i'd written an article back in 2013 for gizmodo Called procrastination and the art of getting things done. I love the fact that you forgot you wrote this article. Yeah, like... uh, it, it was just like, oh yeah, I remember doing that. But it was specifically about a particular event of uh, brain hacking that I'd done in recognizing that I was floundering and not being able to get get through projects, and how it took a week off work and lined up as many projects as i could get you know kind of parts for and ideas for get everything laid out specifically like you mentioned before earlier about being able to just work on what grabbed you in that moment and then i set myself a goal with one particular project to be finished by the end of that week and i still to this day have not finished that project it was to build a coffee table designed it have all the parts still have all the hardware have not built the coffee table but I got when, so when was this article written? 2013, I wrote this. Wow. And it was such a massively productive week of just having so many other little things ticked away on, uh, or just a bit of progression here, a bit of progression there, a bit of learning this, a bit of developing this skill as a, as, as a way of saying, my goal for the end of this week is to have the coffee table done, knowing that I would absolutely procrastinate on that by doing anything else that took my fancy. Yeah, no, you have to set a goal that is the thing that you don't want to do, or like that, that you don't care about getting done, that so that is the goal, and then you'll do the thing you actually need to do. Absolutely. Even <laughs> if I built the coffee table now, it would be, <laughs> it would be out of place, it would be in the way, it would just not be a, a, a useful thing to build. But it still it's sits like, there the thing. I don't know. No matter what you do, like, for example, if you have, like, university deadlines, so you have to do your assignment, and you've got a month. You would do it the day before or like a couple of hours before the deadline. No matter what you do, like you, you can't force yourself to do it. And then you load it up. You're like, okay, I'm going to do it this weekend. But then you're like, oh, maybe I need to clean this. Oh, my table is so messy. I can't do my assignment without it being cleaned. And then it spirals from there. You don't get your assignment done until like the very last day where you have to do it. Do you all know why that is? Why that's a thing? with with people who have adhd um why why you can get things done at the last minute when you couldn't get them done when you had three months to do it 
there's a reason. There is tell a us, reason. Tell us. <laughs> um, basically, ADHD brains need particular types of stimuli, and there's four four main types of stimuli. Basically, something that is interesting. That's a good one. Something that's interesting, regardless of what that is, it can be different every day. Something that's interesting. Something that's novel, new, never before encountered. That's a good one. That works. Something that you don't necessarily understand. Something that's curious. These are all like, I mean, these are all kind of variations of interesting, but they are different. Like, cause there can be something that's not maybe particularly interesting to like whatever you're interested in that day, but it's new. And so there's that sort of like, okay, I've not, not encountered that, this. Those are all reward feedback, aren't they? If something is neither of those, none of those three things, the only thing that remains that will make an ADHD brain kick into action is urgency. Urgency mm -hmm. works. Urgency mm -hmm. is basically the, is, is the, you know, pull rip cord um, kind of thing. Uh, if you have something that it's just, it's not interesting, it's not new, you've done it a million times, or you, you, you know exactly what to expect. It's not, there's, there's no curiosity involved. Um, if it suddenly becomes urgent, you'll do it. But if mm -hmm. it's not urgent yet, forget about it. S Your brain's like this, there is no <laughs> reward here. There's nothing here. There's nothing here for me. Um, so yeah, you can have three months to do it. And that's great. But if it's not one of those other things, your brain's like, Pfft. and so the second <laughs> it becomes urgent, you can do it and you will. Mm -hmm. And like, there's actually even a decent chance you'll get it done because at that point, then you got friggin' adrenaline and like <laughs> all of the like scary, then you have cortisol and all the scary hormones, they kick in. Um, so it doesn't yeah. feel nice. The urge, like getting things, working under the urgency tent um, sucks which is why it's something I now try yeah. to avoid because I, I hate the way it feels. Mm -hmm. I really hate the way the urgency thing. It, the thing is, is it works. It sucks that like I can, I can see it work and yeah. I can see how so many people with ADHD, particularly undiagnosed ADHD, get sucked into this loop of only ever doing things at the last minute because that's the only time they can actually get themselves to do it. But also it, works and they get it done even though it sucks and feels horrible it does work so they kind of keep doing it and like it's a weird sort of like it's addictive slightly masochistic you yeah. know reward yeah. system um it's totally addictive because our brains um our, brain, our brains even if we have habits that are toxic and that hurt us our brains reward us for things that are familiar so you we rem remember the fact it's like well that worked last time so your brain your brain can basically be telling you it's like well Oh, it's like you're it's sort of fueling your procrastination because it's going like well it i i know that i can do it in in two days or one day or just do it overnight exactly. and then so it's almost like that kind of like perpetuates it and then the other thing as well actually is that um there's obviously there are obviously strong links between um the challenges associated with um different forms of neurodiversity and self-esteem and confidence uh -huh. um and and to some degree perfectionism oh, yeah. so the thing i battle with um is that yeah. I know that if I start something early, say something, it might be something that's doable in two days. Actually, I, I sit here saying this now. I've got to edit. I've got to edit a video. <laughs> Ruth will probably listen to this. I've got to edit a YouTube video that goes up on Wednesday, <laughs> and I'll probably and I'll probably end up. My problem is if I start it really early. Don't listen, I'll Ruth. Get, I'll um, <laughs> if I start it really early, I will. I'll just spend like even longer on it. I'll just spend like oh. five days on a thing that should take like you know two days or a day and a half or something because. I'll just get obsessed and it'll never be finished and, it, and it's never finished anyway even and when it goes up the it's, not, a it's lot. not finished um and that's like and that's a perfectionism sort of self-esteem thing it's a fact that it's a fact that even though i've done something lots of times i'll still there's still a part of me that thinks like this is the time i'm going to fail this is the time it's like the imposter syndrome thing it's like this is the time that i'm just going to mess it all up and it's going to be terrible and rubbish and that like that fuels the procrastination um and and this this weird practical thing that the fact that if I started it a week early or two weeks early, I would I wouldn't be able to put it down, and I, and it would just become like yeah it would just become wrapped up with all these other things that were going on and it's it's such a bizarre thing because it's it's like it's sort of tied into so many different facets of stuff. It doesn't actually mean you'll do a better job, just that you'll spend more time doing it. Yeah, and probably be stressed longer. 
yeah yeah it's 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 bizarre and it's yeah and it's and, and that 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 sort of like yeah you described it as like the kind of the tent of being under the in that stress zone and that is what we were talking about earlier this cognitive overload and the reality is that um there's two really critical things to remember about that is that firstly that um we like neurodivergent people think and make decisions less like like it's much harder to make decisions and do things so even though even though like you you might overcome your procrastination get things done in the and you might be able to hyper focus for example um actually you it even though you're sort of hyper focusing and you for some people like like not everyone can hyper, sort of hyper focus or feel like they're in flow in a time of urgency um and this is where, where like you know you can't we can't use like neurodiversity to you can't like apply a label for everybody because someone who's got adhd might really thrive in a really urgent like get stuff done scenario and someone with a dyslexia of, might just be so overwhelmed do. and not be able to achieve something um but not everyone yeah but not Every everyone yeah everyone is different we may have we may we may have the same labels sometimes but that doesn't make us identical and you'll find i think that you'll have overlap with some people and not with others and et cetera, et cetera. yeah at the and end of the day the, like you were saying we're all just very different yeah, yeah i think the line touched on it earlier that thing of like when the um i think you're talking about like the 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 sort of mood or the place you're in having a real like impact on on stuff and it's like if um you know if your life is is sort of chaotic then the way that your you know neurodivergence might affect you might be totally different yeah mm -hmm. we always right. like try to i don't know i feel like we don't give up we love challenges and we just keep going no matter what whereas i don't know someone else who was a neurodivergent if they got hit by a problem will they still continue or will they take time or whatever but like i know that if something like I, if i was constantly having like bad bad like omen or, or like like things aren't working out for me i just try to look for another solution like try and think outside the box and keep going like fight <laughs> fight till the very end yeah. I, have, I, have we all kind of spent four hours learning something that could have been a 10 minute phone call to a friend who already knows shut up jamie you know i have <laughs> <laughs> you've been that phone call <laughs> your, your text message i suppose that the, the i've already spent four hours watching youtube videos and reading things and i still don't understand what the difference is in in you know in resistance and the wires are jamie tell me about the resistance <laughs> of the wire. <laughs> like yeah, this is literally a thing but then how, how many times has that gone several layers deep as well where you know like you might have uh, asked me a question on something and i've gone oh i know a little bit but i'll get us this far and then i'll i'll phone someone else or i'll send someone else a message and then we yeah. end up three or four layers deep and <laughs> yeah no that is a, that is that is definitely a thing fortunately we like talking to each other so <laughs> it's true but then we all end up learning something as well yeah, that's, that's very. I think, I think I think there's a, there's key points there. I mean, I've talked about yeah, if these neurodivergents can give us superpowers. Yeah, whether that's hyper focus, whether that's being able to uh, see things in a way that other people can't, whether it's um, yeah, but a, a, a prime example, it, it's it's thought that Mozart was um, neurodivergent. Probably, probably lines that have passed. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. If you, if you look at probably, yeah, seventy-five percent, if not more, of uh, of actually, that'd be quite. I, what I think someone was fancy doing is going back to university and studying the history of science, and it'd be interesting to actually maybe look at that from almost like a psychological point of view and see Take all the boxes, can, <laughs> see enough boxes to see where there's yeah some of the great names in in science, and I, I know some of them. Da Vinci, really that. Uh, clearly, Einstein. So that's been, um, that has been done with um, that's been done and has been there have been some studies looking at that, but specifically with people like Da Vinci who wrote a lot, because in the context yeah. of like dyslexia, you there are um, there are set ways of communicating information or processing information that we now associate with from lots of people who've been assessed for dyslexia now. So these sort of data sets. So we can take some of those ways of communicating information and, and learning and that we understand now. Um, and apply them to people who wrote a lot in the past. So Da Vinci is mm. one example of that. Um, is Darwin another as well? Because I know that that was uh, certainly for mental health things. I think Darwin's 
flagged up a couple of things in some of his writings. Yeah, it's funny. It's a funny one, Darwin. It's, um, because it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. Some interesting things about Darwin that make him potentially less um, uh, yeah, less slightly problematic of a character in some ways. But um, but yeah, it's um, not just night. scientists too, but artists as well. Yep. I feel like that's mm. also what a big mm. one that like you can look at. And it's funny because the first person who popped in my mind is is still alive. Um, it's because I, I feel like there was very much I was thinking a lot of like people who are long long past. But um, you can look at certain artists and you can almost see like the ah oh, okay I know what your special interest is like Yayoi Kusama, who <laughs> literally covers everything in polka dots, and it's a brilliant art, amazing art, very cool mm. artist. She actually speaks about like how she like speaks about mental illness and various things. So like, she's not necessarily, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know that I'm reaching here um, necessarily, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Brilliant mind, not necessarily science. It did sound, Looking I, back. I'm not, again, talking from personal experience really for the science. Um, that is your area of expertise. Art is mine. My area of experience. I wouldn't necessarily say expertise, but my area of experience. I would. Um, but I think there's also, I mean, there are also, and we've also touched on you know, some of those sort of daily struggles, you know, the procrastination, the, the focusing on the things that maybe are the distractions away from things that maybe we should be thinking about, like eating properly or going to the dentist. Um, I got that and, one down now. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> they schedule and, and, the and then they call you and they tell Google you, Google hey, calendar. Go up. <laughs> yeah. A virtual assistant. Yeah. <laughs> But also oh. sleep. Sleep is very oh, difficult. Oh. You go to sleep and you're like, okay, time to get, well, you know, it's like the best part of your, like, you know, day, I guess. I look forward to sleep. I'm just like, I could, you know, refresh my mind and start a day. But then when you go to sleep, getting to sleep is the hardest thing to do. Because, because you start having you ideas? Want, you break, no, not ideas, thoughts, anxiety. <laughs> things oh, like no, that your yes. brain doesn't shut down and like medication helps because usually at the end of the day you're just so tired that you just want to go into bed but then if you're not tired and your brain's still active and still mm. wants to do things but you're like i have work tomorrow i have to sleep then at that time you're in bed all these thoughts all these noise come back and the only way to wind it down for me is listening to like music you know any sort of music like loud music nature music because i love like nature and things like that so it has to be something loud that can kind of be louder than my thoughts i don't know how yeah i was gonna say over overwhelm the senses isn't it yeah yeah so then when you start listening to that because i i feel like i'm a more um i listen more i i struggle to look at things whereas i'm a good listener so when listening to that i'm able to wind down and go to sleep basically it's very hard for me to, to go to sleep, but if I'm not tired, music helps me wind down. I, 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 I would recommend utter here. exhaustion is good for getting to sleep. That's, that's uh, the kind of the approach that, I normally take. That'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I love the diversity even just amongst us here because yeah. like I I, I I definitely have to admit that like I because it's 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 a thing I don't experience. I'm very fascinated by the experiences of of you too sean and delani because like y'all have like what you just described like visual stuff is is difficult for you delani but but the sound and hearing is like that's that's what speaks to your brain and i am the polar opposite i have auditory processing issues listening to mm -hmm. stuff is difficult but my visual processing is top notch so like if i can read a thing it's in you say it to me, I'm like, what? Wow. Like, it's it's fascinating though how mm. like just slightly different wiring effectively ha can have such a profound effect um, in everything you do and how you again kind of go through your life. Like, I don't know, I I don't I don't I find this stuff kind of amazing and fascinating in that sort of like look at how cool we are as human beings. <laughs> We're so weird. <laughs> I, 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 I think for the for the maker community, I mean I, again I, I, I mentioned earlier, yeah, one of the reasons I wanted to sort of talk about this, not only is it it's I think it's an important thing, we need to talk about these things more often. 
Yes. And we need to raise these issues, which is what a lot of these group chats have been about, normalizing, yeah, this mm -hmm. sort of conversation. But I think, uh, yeah, the, the maker community for me is, I, I see so much, and I, I, I can recognize based on my experience as an educator, based on kind of my own kind of study in terms of kind of learning about neurodiversity, and I see so much of it within the maker community. And I think it's amazing. Yeah, it's not something that anyone needs to be frightened of. It's not something that is a thing that's a problem. I think it's amazing. Like when I read through yeah, every month, a Hackspace magazine comes out. And I see some of the projects that people have been coming up with. When I, I don't as often go through maybe Instructables or Make and, and some of the projects that they're producing. But yeah, uh, Maker Update that uh, Donald Bell and uh, I've got another gentleman and, and Becky uh, Stern yeah. sometimes presents. And I see some of the projects that they kind of highlight every every week. They're highlighting these new set of projects, and it's mind blowing and amazing the things that are being produced by people within the maker community, and kind of yeah. You kind of know full well that some of those people, some of those people are, you know, will be up and are neurotypical, and they just they happen to be expertise. Of, yeah, they have to be their, their particular expertise and interest is something that is kind of yeah, fitting nicely. But I, I again, it'd be an interesting study to see, and, and probably a very difficult study to do, but it'd be a very interesting study to see how many people that get kind of on, you know, maker update that are in. Hackspace magazine are neurodiverse when kind of assessed by kind of yeah any mm -hmm. regular assessment of mm -hmm. of those things. Whether it's you know being on the autistic spectrum, whether it's being some form again spectrum of ADHD, whether it's having one of those you know, specific learning differences that gives them a superpower in some form that they are then able to express as some manifestation physically or not necessarily physically but yeah within the the, the the software world and it's it's to me it's just it's just amazing i think we're all stats hungry as well aren't we we're i think we've all kind of demonstrated that tonight of you know yeah. in one form or another <laughs> like, oh, i want to find out how uh, i mean again that's that's linking back into it all as well and delaney i yeah. wanted to touch on something that you were um talking about specifically with sleep but i know that something that i definitely hugely guilty of is uh, a thing called revenge bedtime procrastination what? which is where you it, it's it, uh duncan was talking about it recently and i realized the pair of us are absolute sods for it but when you've had like a really busy day and been sort of doing lots of things for lots of other people and not quite had time to process things for yourself you get to a point where you you might be absolutely exhausted but you're still trying to stay up later and trying to just delay that going to bed to try and sort through your thoughts or finish something for, for you for your own sort of gratification or or that kind of thing and it's, it's that particular term of revenge revenge bedtime procrastination of just making yourself more exhausted tomorrow it's, it's and then tomorrow Problem. And then Netflix, Netflix weaponized that with the like, <laughs> we're going to play the next thing now. Here's the next <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I play it just the uh, same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and YouTube, God. if you've got auto auto play too. <sighs> there was um there was a really interesting uh there was a really interesting study from uh, Cambridge University that um, on the subject of like us liking stats and things. Um, yeah. I think relatively recently it came out. There's this um this recent research on like uh, cognition behaviour um from these sort of brain experts at Cambridge Uni, and they were. They concluded in this recent study that people with dyslexia are uniquely specialized to explore the unknown um and that this is likely to play a sort of fundamental role in our um and our like human ad adaptation to uh, like changing environments so basically this idea that dyslexic people are basically better um at um at responding to just like new unknown stimuli um and they were sort of they were sort of arguing that that in the context of why um why like neuro neurodiversity is still around basically we know that we know that through human through natural selection 
that um, basically we evolve to shed traits that aren't advantageous to us and retain ones that enable us to survive. Um, and that ultimately that sort of goes some way to saying, well, why this is why, you know, dyslexia is um, or ADHD or autism are still around is because they've basically been at being advan advantageous to yeah. us in they're, social they're groups. They're actually evolutionarily yeah. useful. Yeah, and I guess the, the the classic example of that is like a scenario where you know you've got a group of a group of hunter gatherers, and if you've got someone who um, I would take sleep as an example, Delaney, like if you've got someone who's like kind of like you know a bit more hyperactive and like I'm awake, I'm paying attention to it. They're the one who's gonna gonna. Um, Where the tigers? Them. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. Um, so people who like sleep differently, but also people who um, who kind of like learn and think differently. There's a real there's a real mm -hmm. advantage to that socially. Um, yep. And yeah, this this recent study was sort of you know, quite conclusively um, showing that in the context of dyslexia in scenarios where there's the unknown and in, and in the maker community, it's like we we're seeking out like unique unknown challenges. So you've got this sort of weird selective mm. thing. You've got, you know, are there more engineers and makers and artists who are who are neurodivergent because they um, they potentially like struggled with more traditional forms of education? Or are they there because they're more, you know, naturally suited to that area? Um, it's like a sort of weird thing, sort of chicken or egg thing of like, are we, are we there because we're, yeah, yeah, and it's hugely selective. And I think, I think in the, in the maker community, you've got it's twofold because you've got um, people who've got these sort of di you know, diverse skills at being able to do lots of different things and and think in different ways. You've got um, you've got this sort of like, um, and I think Delaney was saying about earlier about the um, uh the um the kind of like finding ways to kind of calm yourself and center yourself like making is, a, is itself is often a form of that it's like it's like yeah. a it's like yeah, it's often therapy isn't it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, i just wanted to add to your point sean unknown like I, I didn't realize that because the reason why i'm doing like next step is studying uh, astronautics and space engineering and the reason why I love space is because it's unknown and I just want to explore the unknown. Like what is out there? Is aliens, do they exist? I just want Curiosity. to create Curiosity. Basically, Curiosity. yeah. yeah. And it was a hobby that I liked doing anything relating to the unknown of space or, and new planets or whatever. I would be like, well, what was happening? But then I didn't think my hobby can be my job. So then if my hobby can be my job, I would still be curious. It would still be interesting new and mm -hmm, it'd be mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. that i'd enjoy so then that's why like when you said exactly unknown, it's good. like clicking yeah like oh yeah. is it because of my dyslexia or adhd but uh so we said yeah, a like, group of cool. neurodiverse makers are going to be the first people to produce the warp drive and actually get out into space <laughs> yes Probably. i was thinking that i was like thinking yes. oh i, I might i want to work like i'm so into like you know watching star trek Doctor I mean, Who. 3D printers are replicators, so, so... Thing. I'm just like, I, there needs to be a warp drive. If we can, like, travel in hyperspeed to, like, you know, all parts of the universe, does the multiverse exist? What other versions of me are there? <laughs> it's just things like that. And I'm like, I want to work in tech <laughs> that, like, do all this stuff, but I need to... It's, well, know, I think it's we need really... to develop the, the matrix kind of plug in the back of the neck, download all the information... <laughs> Thing as well because i think that would, that I mean, would speed it up for all of us no <laughs> that cool. feels that insane anymore to me like, no, it feels just... like ah, 15 years 20 years away you know well, maybe you, you know, Musk's maybe kind 10. of doing it with monkeys isn't he so they're kind of you know sticking sticking chips and monkeys monkeys heads true yeah, 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 yeah. 32, i'll be all right uh, yeah. but now this is exactly this is exactly the kind of thing that will make you amazing at your job delani because it is it stimulates a part of your brain that just like it's is like very there, much it? energizer battery. Like it, it will feed yeah. itself in a way that is amazing. And I personally, I don't know about the rest of you, but I forget sometimes that there are lots of people out there who aren't like this, who aren't overflowing with weird ideas or feeling that sort of constant pull towards mm -hmm. certain things that feel really good actually like they feel really good to do and that that sort of itch that when you're scratching it is just like oh it's so good um <laughs> there, there are people out there who they don't experience this i forget that 
I forget that because I, I, I get so pulled into my own experience sometimes that mm. I forget that it isn't actually the standard experience. And, and, and there are people out there who that, are experiencing the same thing, don't necessarily be aren't aware that what they are experiencing is neurodiversity. Oh, yeah. Uh, this know, definitely applied to me. They've, for they've got time. through, they've, yeah. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I, I got through school. I didn't think I was neurodiverse. I, I, I was different. Yeah, mm. I was. I was. I was a bit of a geek. I was not. Yeah, I was not sporty. I was not very social. But I didn't think that was. That, that was just. I didn't. There, there was no label. Yeah, it's easy yeah. to to not. Well, the polite aware. ones, anyway. Mm. I wanted to say as well, like when um, at school, when I was struggling with English. Yeah, like no one really picked up dyslexia or whatever. Or when I'm struggling with subjects, they're just, they're just like, oh, like you're on low set because you're dumb or something. And then my parents would be like, okay, you need to go to tuition. They would pay for me to go to all these tuition classes. But then those teachers don't know how to teach me because they don't know I have dyslexia or ADHD. And I still don't understand it. So then they also like, yeah, like, you know, it's just yeah. no point because like they're not trying, they're lazy. And I'm just like, if there's some teachers you understand what they're teaching because of their teaching methods so it's just mm -hmm. like depending on the teaching methods you're able to understand but yeah like people uh like even with this education system like it's very hard to find out if you do have like a a, a, a learning disability or not because it's either you're dumb or or it's lazy like or you pass you under the radar entirely <laughs> basically yeah, which is in a, um, which is like a you know particularly relevant when we're talking about um, you know we see over representation of um, those diagnosed with different forms of learning differences between um, mm -hmm. between those who identify as, as as men compared to those who identify as women. Um, it's like we see there's a real distinction there. I mean, it's, there's a real challenge for for um, women to get diagnosed with autism, for example. Um, and and the, the idea that people have of these things are these very, very narrow, very rigid ideas that are usually based on boys, like not even mm. men, but boys. Yeah, and often boys. old research into boys as well. So yeah, yeah, but also a, a very specific like subset of boys, like not even mm. like a diverse group of boys, but like boys mm -hmm. from a particular part of the world yeah. in a particular class with a particular type of upbringing. Like mm -hmm. it's so small, it's so small, which is why, yeah, so many people just are just kind of like, oh no, you're, you don't, you're, you aren't autistic. You don't have ADHD, you aren't dyslexic. Like you seem fine mm -hmm. <laughs> because you don't yeah. look like, mm -hmm. you know, this thing. Not realizing yeah. that you're just very good at masking. Mm -hmm. or it's and I guess a lot of people. Like idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess a lot of people just want to be normal because if like you're not normal and you have imperfections and that's a weakness and then you would lose the people around you because you're afraid of like, you know, they're, they're going to see the weaknesses and think that you're not worth it like for them. You, you don't have anything that you can contribute to, but that's not the case. Like when you learn to embrace your, you know, your abilities, your superpowers, you can actually do so much more than you can think. And mm. I guess like once you understand that, then you could basically contribute. <laughs> yeah, contribute as much as you can. But like the thought of being normal is well, it makes us afraid of like, you know, getting checked out or thinking about it. Because I feel like whenever we think, oh, people are saying this, I need to get it checked out. You're like avoiding it. You're running away from it. But once you face your problems and you actually try and think about things or have that time to process everything then like yeah you need to it, it takes a lot of courage to be able to say hmm i'm gonna work through this and then that was with me when i heard that i had dyslexia and adhd i just wanted to run away from it i wanted to hide it i didn't want to tell anyone i didn't want to embrace it it was so i thought it was an embarrassment not being normal but like once i accepted it and once i learned how to work through it I was able to do so many cool things. Like I was able to, you know, invest time on me to see what else I could do. And one of the things that I realized that with my dyslexia, I am a very visual person. So words, not good. Pictures, memories. I'm able to look at a page and scan it 
and then be able to imagine that page uh, when I'm like answering a question for some reason. I can see it in front of me. Yeah, and that is weird. So, yeah, so I didn't realize I had photographic memory right, till like two weeks ago. And I was like, oh, this is stupid. Like, no, I can't have photographic memory because it doesn't make sense. Like, I, I'm, yeah. And then I started like, you know, having that time to process that and then reflecting back at all the moments of my time. And I'm like, wow, I, I think I do have photographic memory, but I'd like to work on it. So enhance it so that I could remember a whole textbook, for example. Mm. And that is something that I currently want to look at, but procrastinating <laughs> but well, those yeah. kind of like eidetic memory traits are uh, generally associated with things like autism spectrum disorders um yeah. you know specifically like perfect recall and uh, you know kind of like true eidetic memory which is rain man yeah 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 I mean, well rain man's an, an interesting one actually because the, the 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 kind of the key markers for um sort of presentations of autism uh you generally don't get I forget the, the specific number, but there's there's a, a number of presentations that are associated with autism. And generally speaking, people diagnosed with an autistic autism spectrum disorder will present a few of those features. Because in mm. specifically in the film Rain Man, he presents all of them, which is mm. just does not happen. Mm. But Rain Man in particular was based on um, a guy called Kim Peake who's kind of the closest or, or the, the the person that's had the largest number of these things yeah. uh, or these presentations um, and those kind of things of you know perfect recall or eidetic memory uh, are kind of associations that tend to be linked to people with autism spectrum disorders um, and it's sort of like savant that kind of uh, yeah. mm. kind of part of the spectrum that is interesting. I yeah, because the reason why like I decided or thought I had autism was like I was like showing these characteristics, but then my like like stereotypical mindset of someone with autism is completely different because you don't realize that there's a huge variety or big Massive spectrum. spectrum yeah. yeah, and uh, that's why I didn't think about it. And then now I'm like, oh, I'm presenting this. I, I I'm really good with my sensory so smells like i like to smell my food uh i don't know why but then like some smells trigger memory so smelling a perfume can like take me back to 10 years ago to when i'm doing something and i'm just like wow like and then touch as well i, I don't really like feeling touch like sharp objects for some reason like i i, I like it's, to touch yeah, there's, things. there's good sensory input and bad sensory yeah, input sensory. for sure yeah, yeah. Time, yeah. And then also like social, I guess. Uh, I, I can be uh, an extrovert, but I am really an introvert. I like to be alone doing my things. But if I need to be an extrovert, I can. I can talk to people. But it's something that I prefer not to do, but then, or not to but be in a situation. <laughs> but I could try. I could try. Yeah. But then there's so many other things. Like I, I read about like autism. Even when I had my ADHD assessment, he was like, yeah, you're not in the aut autistic spectrum, so like, forget about it. But then it, it was still in my head. I was like looking through these and I'm like, I'm sure I have it because like, I'm I can be really awkward making eye contact. I can't look at someone's face directly and speak to them for long. I have to talk and then look away, talk and look away. I can't just make eye contact. That, that's, I feel like that's scary and um, yeah, and like uh, physical contact as well. Like, I don't like being in small crowded spaces. I don't know if that's because I'm claustrophobic, but I don't like people touching me either. So that's there's, a, there's, a there's quite a few. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's why I was like, I, I need to get it checked out, but then don't want to wait, like, you know, a long time on the waiting list. To, like, you know, because four years, again, is quite a long time. And I think there's a lot of good reading things. now on the internet and i think you can also access a lot of the same diagnostic criteria that professionals yeah. use um, yes. so that you don't necessarily have to go through the ordeal of having to recount literally every childhood experience you ever had or having to get family members that perhaps you're not super comfortable with having speak about you talk to a doctor as well and like there's a bunch of aspects yeah. to it that again are quite invasive and not very um 
they're very frequently done with sensitivity or very infrequently done with sensitivity. They're, they're very mm. insensitive about it. Um, but there's a lot that you can actually just kind of learn about yourself now, which I think is really helpful yeah. for something like self-diagnosis. Because again, there's no treatment for mm. autism. There's no, yeah. it, if you are in university, it can be useful because then you can get accommodations. Yeah. It's the accommodations, um, isn't it? I mean, yes. I mean, for somebody like me, the there, there is That's absolutely the no it. point me getting an assessment other than yeah. to say oh i've had an assessment yeah just to because say official i'm, I'm in uh, my 50s without a doubt yeah i'm <laughs> probably never going to work for anyone ever again i'll only ever work for myself and so there's yeah. there's no need that any accommodations are ones that i can but build into my own also life. a lot of places will not necessarily ask for a, a doctor's note either you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. like they will take your word for it they will like if you say yes mm -hmm. i need these accommodations and it is because I fall under this umbrella, I'll go, mm -hmm. okay, we believe yeah. you. You know, yeah. like sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes they want a doctor's note, in which case then, yeah, then you're on the path to... But then sometimes medical records get lost. Life. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, don't, don't even get me started. Uh, <laughs> don't even get me started. Moving, moving countries is, is, is super fun. I am starting to feel a bit like a pumpkin, though. Um, I think it is getting towards that time. Yeah. We're two. We're two hours fifteen. I think we've had a we've had a fantastic conversation. Um, I think we 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 probably ask more questions than we can we've asked, which I, is I great. Like and and it's, it's great. But for a while longer. It's about normalising. Yeah, these conversations. So, I think probably, there's already yeah. been some fantastic feedback both in the chat and uh, I've seen some. Uh, you know, passing on my my regards to all of you for for being wonderful yeah. from that. From so, uh, so I think it, other yeah, times. I think we'll we'll. We'll, we'll stop today. Um, I mean, yeah, we'll we won't do the normal. Normally, Delani, we do kind of yeah. What's been grabbing your attention this week? But we we skip that when we do group chats because it, special, it, it's special events. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's a special event. We're focusing on the conversation that we've had and that rather than kind of just thinking about other things. Uh, people can f obviously people know where Ali and Sean. We your usual list of places you can be found. Uh, Will be listed as normal. Um, yeah. Delani, I've put uh, in the show notes already. I've put your Instagram. Is there anywhere else people can find you apart from Instagram? LinkedIn. Like I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm. I will respond to you on LinkedIn if you contact me. Um, but it's work, work related. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's more of a work, work kind of place, really. LinkedIn thing, is yeah. rather than kind of social, 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 media social yeah. Uh, but Instagram I, I, would be more, a more people are using it want. socially, I think. So it, it is, it is yeah. a thing I've heard. I don't have a crossover, yeah. Mm, yeah. LinkedIn, yeah. Mm. either well, one, I, think... I don't have a preference of anything. Okay, LinkedIn, well, it's, Instagram, or... Instagram, is, Instagram is linked, and if people are listening this far, they can they can they can hunt down your, your, your LinkedIn, mm -hmm. they kind of want exactly. to kind of work things. I think it's, it's worth also saying, uh, obviously, thank you to our guests, absolutely. Um, it's been thank you for having us glorious and wonderful thank you. yeah mm -hmm. thank you very much this is this is always a chat that i find to be incredibly stimulating and very interesting and i hope helpful to people who are listening i think i want to finish I, just by saying if there are people listening who kind of think uh some of these things that people they've been saying tonight kind of fit with the that way definitely will be there always is there always yeah is. Yep. absolutely <laughs> reach out to us but yeah don't yes. don't not reach out to your GP and there are there are, there are means mm. by which you can get assessed and it might be that actually that could provide you with accommodations and things like ADHD access to you know the kind of the medications that could make your life easier um, and there's nothing wrong with you and no. you are still a cool cat even if you Absolutely. have something that makes you different being different is <laughs> I think I think uh, I mean a word that was mentioned earlier. So people said, you know, not being normal. I think, yeah. You know, well, what does normal mean anyway? It, normal, it's actually, yeah. I think, we Average. need to normalize. We need to normalize <laughs> neurodiversity because there are people from neurodiverse, and it is not abnormal. It no, is a we're normal probably in the of, majority, even. I mm. suspect so. I suspect yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, I think we're we are not a minority. I think yeah. we are a quiet majority. It yeah. just doesn't like to talk to people, so therefore we don't seem like them. But yeah. in that vein, if someone does need some help with pathways to treatment or diagnosis, 
and don't feel comfortable tackling that on your own, reach out, um, whether that's to us or to others close to you and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. I've got a wealth of um, of like neurodiversity resources. I'm always happy to point people in the direction of so if anyone wants to message me and be like, where do I find out more about things? Just um, yeah, get in touch. Oh, really interesting. On that note, thank I think you again, folks. Thank you, and let's say goodbye to all the people who are still listening. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.